It's that time of year again to look at one of the most popular, powerful, and most creative companies out there, Disney. But the truth is Disney's been pretty busy since I started Disney December, buying up a lot of other very popular and creative properties. Two of the ones that have gotten the most attention are Marvel and Star Wars, two universes that Disney has breathed life into unlike anything we've seen before. Marvel now has a gigantic cinematic universe that all connects, and one of the most popular film series of all time has been reborn, making up for what many consider the sins of the past. Well, seeing how these are not only under Disney, but have given birth to some gigantic creative realms, it only seems fitting to take a look at these two. The downside is there's not enough Marvel or Star Wars yet to fill up the entire month. So, once again, I'll be looking at all the ones I haven't touched on yet all the Disney movies that have yet to be given the disney Simber treatment. And naturally, not only will I be looking at all the Marvel movies and Star Wars movies, as well as the special editions, but I'll be going over the new ones coming out, like The Good Dinosaur, and of course, The Force Awakens. Now as many of you know, copyright has gotten even tighter over the years, so just to be safe, we're going to be using images on this one. But they're still the same length, and they're still the same opinions that you would expect. Or maybe not expect, you just have to watch to find out. It's the biggest mishmash of properties ever, but hey, that's Disney for ya. And we're here to look, analyze, and have fun with some of the most enjoyable films. So sit back, everybody. This is Disney Sember, the Marvel, Star Wars, and everything else edition. I guess it only figures to start off with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, seeing how much it's changed things and how incredibly long going it is. And this universe began with Iron Man. Going in, I knew very little about the comic. I knew it was just a guy in a metal suit who flew around and shot up stuff. I had no idea the backstory, the characters, or anything like that. So it was kinda nice going in with fresh eyes and nothing to really compare it to. Robert Downey Jr. plays Tony Stark, a technology-obsessed billionaire who likes to make weapons of destruction. He's arrogant, a playboy, and totally full of himself. But that all changes when a terrorist group kidnaps him and forces him to make a weapon for them. He befriends another kidnapped technician, and they decide rather than make the weapon that they want, they make one to get the hell out of there, under the guise of a terrorist bomb. After creating a pretty badass suit and escaping, Tony decides to devote his life to no longer destroying lives, but rather saving them. Thus, he puts together the Iron Man suit, starts flying around the world, and stopping trouble wherever he sees it. The only problem is his partner businessman, played by Jeff Bridges, doesn't like the changes he's made and tries to make his own robotic suit to stop it. Along with his secretary Pepper Potts, played by Gwyneth Paltrow, and his bodyguard, played by John Farreau, the film director, it's high-flying technology to see who can do the least amount of damage and the most amount of damage. Again, having no idea how much this connects to the comic, I have to say the story for this is brilliant. We've seen these kind of tales all the time, the Moses story, where someone is bad, goes into exile, and comes back a hero. But here, it's a good update. With our obsession on technology, this makes a lot of sense. And Tony Stark represents everything that people want to be nowadays. They want to be obsessed with technology, but they also kind of want to be full of themselves. They want to be doing good things, but they want to have the badass one-liners. They want to be smooth, but they want to be troubled. They want a life of luxury, but still doing some pretty badass things. Creating the best with the best, and the best from the least. It's also nice to see a superhero we haven't seen in a while that has technology that probably doesn't exist now, but you can see existing kinda soon. And he doesn't just use gadgets like Batman does, he surrounds himself in the technology. It's all down to his wits. And the best thing about it is that it comes from a brilliant mind. He doesn't just rely on people to build it, he builds a lot of it himself as well. He's a guy who utilizes every resource that he can, and yet he's still so crazy. In some respects, he's a drunk, and a loser, and a womanizer, and he's just kind of a dick. But his need to want to do good, especially from such a troubled past, makes him so incredibly interesting. And at the center of that is Robert Downey Jr., who makes this movie. Now don't get me wrong, this is still a good film, but if it wasn't for him, it wouldn't be half the movie it was. This is the ultimate comeback performance. This guy has had a shaky past, and now he's the movie star everybody wants to be. He always has the great one-liner, and even if he doesn't, he can say it so that it sounds like a great one-liner. Just like the transformation of the Iron Man character, this guy is transformed as well. In many respects, staying the same, but in others, making the exact right choices at the exact right time. Now, is it perfect? No, there are a few problems, especially in the second half. 
This movie reminds me a lot of Batman Begins, where the first half is some of the best exposition and build-up for a backstory ever, and the second half, when they have to get to the action, is kind of underwhelming. Yeah, it's neat seeing him fly around in that metal suit, but he doesn't really do that much action with it. And the big battle at the end is just against another guy in an even bigger suit, and yeah, something about that just seems kinda dull. At first, Jeff Bridges, who's kind of unrecognizable in this, seems like he'd be a really good villain. But then when he puts that dumb-looking outfit on, he just kinda looks like a video game baddie. Even the lines he says are kind of corny, and he says them kind of corny, and I don't know, this wasn't the movie we started out with. This is more like how the Disney Channel would do a superhero climax, not this movie. It's not god-awful or laughably bad, it's just not as engaging as the first half. But the stuff that's good is just too damn good. The main lead is likable, the technology is inventive, the story is solid and very easy to understand and relate with, the comedy is fresh, the side characters are entertaining, it's just a good, strong superhero flick. I guess I should probably mention the after credit sequence, which now is played at the end of every Marvel movie, with Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury saying that he's starting up a team. Now, some people out there got really excited because they knew he's talking about the Avengers. But here's the thing. A lot of movies had to be continues at the end and after the credits, and a lot of times they never went anywhere. So even though there's that little hint, nobody really got that excited yet. Everybody kind of thought, oh yeah, wouldn't it be cool if that happened? But nobody actually was thinking, oh yeah, it's happening. This big universe where everybody's going to get their own movie and they're all going to come together, yeah. This is going to be one of the biggest things to happen to blockbusters ever. It was just a little tease to show what could happen. But none of us knew what was actually lying ahead. And now, looking back, it's kind of cool that these little end credit sequences that people used to just roll their eyes at and say, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it, now people look forward to at Marvel movies. Because they've come through, because they've proven themselves, because they say, hey, when we give a hint this is coming, it's really coming. It's interesting to watch it now, years later, knowing what this little teaser was going to lead to. Little did we know that this was actually a fantastic start to a cinematic universe that was about to explode. Let's continue looking at the Marvel Cinematic Universe with The Incredible Hulk. Now, it's impossible to talk about this movie without talking about the film version that came before The Hulk. Many people regard it not as one of the worst comic book movies ever made, but one of the biggest comic book mistakes ever made. The movie was directed by Ang Lee, who just got done doing Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. This is a very good, talented director, but he was obviously the wrong one for this. The movie was too abstract, too dramatic, too slow-paced, and somehow made the story of a giant green man who smashes things boring. So it was pretty tough to do a reboot several years later with that bad taste still in our mouths. Is it much better than the last one? Well, yeah, but it's still not that, uh... Okay, let's look at the story. The film brilliantly starts off with an opening credit sequence that actually kind of shows what happened in the previous film. Bruce Banner is a scientist who discovers this formula that makes him a green monster, endangers his girlfriend who's the daughter of a general, gets chased by the military, and disappears into the Amazon. That is the exact plot of the previous film, and yet it's not exactly a sequel. If you came into this film not seeing the first one, you could just see it as, oh, this is the backstory of this character. But there's just enough little changes that you could see it as a reboot. It's very, very clever that way. In my opinion, it's probably the smartest thing in the movie. Bruce Banner this time is played by Edward Norton, which seems like a good choice. He spends his time now in the jungle trying to find a cure for his condition. But the army, as well as his girlfriend, played this time by Liv Tyler, are still on the lookout for him. One man volunteers as Guinea Pig, played by Tim Roth, who also chases Banner while starting to get injections, turning himself into a giant green monster. Thus, the movie ends with Hulk vs. Hulk, with one giant green monster pounding another giant green monster in a city. On paper, it sounds like this would be done a lot better, and even in the film, it kind of is. Edward Norton is a very good replacement, and he does a great job in the role. I'm always impressed how a guy with such a baby face and a high-pitched voice can come off as such an intelligent badass. Everything he says just sounds legitimate, you know he's not bullshitting around ever. Tim Blake Nelson plays a good scientist who may or may not be evil, and Tim Roth, once again, is a very enjoyable villain. 
The surprising downside of this movie is that, once again, the wow factor is very minimal. At first, the buildup is great. You see the Hulk in the shadows, it's kinda hard to make him out, he makes this appearance in a factory behind the smoke, and it's really good. But then the more you see of him, the less impressive he seems to be. I mean, yeah, he growls and snorts and jumps around and throws things, but when you think of a Hulk movie, you want to see the Hulk do really cool stuff. Even the first film at least had some scenes where he's throwing a tank and jumping on planes. Here, he's just kind of running around. And I know the argument, shouldn't the focus be on Bruce Banner and his emotional struggle and all that stuff? Sure. But it's still called The Incredible Hulk, and we want to see the Hulk do something incredible. And you just don't see much of that in this film. Even the complicated plan from the villain kinda seems out of nowhere. And I know you can make the argument, yeah, the serums and everything, they're making him crazy, but haven't we seen that a lot of times before? Hasn't it been done a lot better when you see their descent? With this guy, it just seems like, oh, I wanna stop him because it's my mission, and now I'm just kinda nuts. I don't know, Javert he ain't. Hell, even Javert isn't Javert, but that's another story. It also feels like they're setting up some things that, now in hindsight, don't really go anywhere. Like there's a scene where Tim Blake Nelson gets knocked out and you see him almost kind of go through a weird transformation. You think, oh, what's this going to be? Is this going to be a new villain? Is this going to be a new bad guy? But no, he never appears in any of the other movies, at least not that I know of. On the whole, I guess I wasn't really upset that I saw it or anything. I didn't feel like any time was wasted. It just didn't feel like it was anything that spectacular, or even really that interesting. It was the perfect definition of okay. You want to see Edward Norton be okay? You want to see Tim Roth be okay? You want to see the effects be okay? That's what you're going to get, an okay movie. But again, it's the Incredible Hulk. Why are we only getting okay with the Incredible Hulk? I don't know. I know this movie kind of got panned when it came out, and I don't think it's quite that bad. Like I said, I don't even really think it's really terrible by any means. It's just kind of underwhelming. Once again, though, I have to talk about the after credit sequence. In this one, you think the movie's over and they're just going to have a little throwaway joke at the end, but out of nowhere, suddenly, there's Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. This is very common nowadays for Marvel movies, but back then, you never saw this. You never saw an A-list actor from a Marvel movie suddenly come in saying, Hey, remember that thing we teased at the end of our other film? We're really fucking doing it. And this is when Robert Downey Jr. suddenly exploded as this big celebrity. So to suddenly see him pop in at the end, not just for a little laugh, but actually saying, Yeah, we're holding true to our promises. It was actually kind of chilling. People suddenly start to say, holy smokes, are they really doing this? Are Iron Man and a Hulk gonna be in a movie? And if so, does that mean we're gonna get Thor, Captain America, and God knows how many other Avengers are out there? The idea was suddenly seeming possible. So I guess in a very strange way, the most incredible part of the Incredible Hulk was the credits. And I guess you could take that as an insult, but they were done really well. But what's I say about the rest of the movie? Like I said, it's passable. Not good, not bad, just passable. If you're in the mood to see a Hulk film that's better than the first one, but still doesn't quite reach that level of incredibleness, give it a rent. It's worth a few hours of your time. Iron Man 2, the sequel to one of the biggest superhero films that ever came out. At the end of the last Iron Man movie, we see a superhero do something that I don't think I've ever seen a superhero do in a movie. He reveals his secret identity to the world. When does that ever happen? It's always to a love interest or a close friend or something like that. Whoever just admits to the world that they're a superhero. It's something I've never seen before and got me really excited for the sequel because you would think, wow, this is going to go places we've never seen a superhero movie go before. And in some respects, it does. We see the life of a superhero if he was a celebrity. Tony Stark has taken the law into his own hands, is flying around the world and stopping evil wherever he sees it. And the government, in kind of a confusing way, is powerless to stop it. He's more popular than ever, everybody loves him, and of course, he has his vengeful haters. Mickey Rourke is a villain who vows vengeance against Tony Stark because of some wrongdoing that his father did in the past. He attaches these electric ropes to his hands and suddenly he's one hell of a badass mother. 
But that's not the only thing going wrong. Tony's heart is slowly giving out because of the electronic device that he's using to keep him alive. As put so eloquently, the device that's keeping him alive is also slowly killing him. On top of that, he's upgraded Pepper Potts to take over his business, a new bodyguard named Black Widow, played famously now by Scarlett Johansson, enters the mix, and another big corporation wants to take down Stark by teaming up with Rourke and creating even better war machines. In fact, one of them is even called War Machine. When this film came out, people hated it. All they could do is talk about how god-awful it was. Now, don't get me wrong, it still did really good at the box office, but everybody just despised the hell out of it. Does the film deserve such a bashing? Well, kinda, but I don't know if it deserved quite as much as it got. I guess I'll talk about the good stuff first. It does show kind of the price of celebrity. Tony of course loves the attention, but he realizes that he can't escape himself. No matter how hard he parties or gets drunk, all his misery is always waiting there for him. Except now, it's in public, and everybody can see it. When he gets in a fight with a best friend, suddenly, it makes news. And it makes it even harder for him to figure out how to solve his problems. Mickey Rourke, as well, is a great choice for a villain. He has a wonderful voice, he has a perfect look, he has the strength, he just came off of a huge hit movie. It's an ideal choice. But this does all build up to the biggest problem with the movie. It goes nowhere. Remember that problem with Tony's heart? You could have cut that out and not miss anything. You know how Mickey Rourke is spending most of the movie building these incredible weapons? It's only around a few minutes at the end. Hell, you know how Mickey Rourke is SUPPOSED to be the villain in this? You barely see him. In fact, the main bad guy is just some asshole in a suit. Wait, didn't we already have some asshole in a suit in the last movie? Yeah, we get it, big business bad, but come on, we just dealt with this guy. When there is fighting in the movie, it doesn't really connect to anything that big or epic. Iron Man fights with his friend. Well, okay, looks cool, but who cares? Wouldn't it be cool if that was Mickey Rourke there? I mean, they're friends fighting. We know they're gonna make up. We know they're gonna figure things out. Why are we spending so much time seeing them fight at a party? Remember how Stark upgraded Pepper Potts to run the company? Eh, she doesn't like it. She turns it down after a while. Okay, well, what was the point of that then? There's a lot of time dedicated to Tony and remembering his father and what a jerk he was, only to figure out he wasn't really that much of a jerk. Okay, what did that add? Tony still acts like a jerk. And not the fun kind of jerk, just a jerk jerk. He gets drunk and keeps telling everybody that despite what they think, he knows what he's doing. But he doesn't! He clearly doesn't know what he's doing, and it's not fun to watch. In the first film, he did jerky things, but he still came around to using his brilliant mind. He utilized stuff. He was resourceful. Here, all the times he reassures people that he knows what he's doing, it never comes back into play. Thank God they tackle Black Widow a lot better in the future, because she's kind of a wasted character here. So yeah, the film does have a lot of problems, and in the end, probably doesn't really work. But the strength of it does still come from the cool stuff that we like to see in an Iron Man movie. We like to see the technology, we like to see the one-liners, and again, we like to see Robert Downey Jr. doing the role that redefined him. Even when he's being such a pain in the ass, he is still so funny and so enjoyable to watch. Which is why it's such a letdown when you find out that he actually doesn't know as much as he's letting on, and that he is just getting drunk and acting like an ass. So I don't know, I guess it's bad, but I still think there's some really neat things in there that haven't been done yet. Like tackling the celebrity of a superhero who revealed himself, the technology is upped a little bit, and yeah, you do kind of see Iron Man doing the typical Iron Man stuff, there's just not as much as you would like. In the end, it just kind of feels like a distraction to introduce a few other elements in between Marvel movies. I guess I feel a little bad for it because everybody praised what a masterpiece the first movie was, and yeah, it's good, it's well done, but it had problems too. And everyone seems to forget that when they look at this one. It doesn't work as a whole, but I don't think it's as bad as everybody else built it up to be. And I guess we kind of know that there's more Iron Man movies on the way anyway, so it's not like this is the last one we would ever see. Now, how would that one fare up? Well, we'll get to that when we get to that. But for this one, it's probably the perfect definition of close, but no explosion. So out of all the Marvel superheroes that were gonna get their movies, the one I was probably the most concerned about was Thor because with all the other superheroes, it kind of made sense. They get superpowers, or they're based on technology, or they create stuff. Thor was a god. 
how do you do that? And on top of that, his design was always kind of weird. He had a helmet with these weird wings on it. And I just remember thinking to myself, oh man, this is going to be the one. This is the one that people are just going to roll their eyes at and say, sorry, Marvel, we can't do this. It's just too goofy. But they made the very clever choice of assigning Kenneth Branagh to direct it. Now, this is a guy that hasn't really done any superhero movies, and to be fair, he can be kind of hit and miss, but he's got mad talent, and everything he does is huge. And this movie is no exception. This is a gigantic looking film. Suddenly, the idea of Marvel telling the story of a god sounds unbelievable. Look at Thor, he looks amazing. Look at Odin, he looks amazing. Look at this environment, it's friggin' phenomenal. Which is why it's really ironic that the least impressive part of this movie is what Marvel usually does well, the interaction with the real world. Yep, they just decide to make this a fish out of water story, with Thor pissing off his father Odin and Odin banishing him to the world of Earth, taking away his powers. He spends his time befriending a group of scientists, one of them played by Natalie Portman, learning how to be a true humble hero, and figuring out how to get back to stop his sinister brother Loki from taking over the throne. So on the one hand, you might think the stuff where he goes to Earth is beyond painful, and to its credit, it's not. Is it? Good? Well, I don't know if I can say that. But much like Iron Man, a lot of the likability comes from the charm of the main actor. Chris Hemsworth is a perfect Thor. He can be cocky, but likably naive. He has a lot of anger, but you know deep down he's a gentle guy. And most importantly of all, he adapts. I'm so sick of these movies where the fish out of water just stays stubborn and never wants to change anything. But this guy, he's a warrior, he's fought in battles. So when he throws a cup of coffee on the ground demanding more and they tell him that's not how we do things here, he doesn't demand an explanation or act like a spoiled brat, he says, okay. This is what makes the movie work. He actually evolves, he actually changes. Because of this, we can stomach a lot more of the traditional stuff. Which, with that being said, it is pretty traditional. The love interests and side characters on Earth are not very interesting. The battle scenes are kind of standard. And yeah, was this the best story you could have done with the idea of Thor? Probably not. But luckily, they do often come back to the world of the gods. And every time it does, it looks amazing. You feel the gigantic size and weight of this again, even though it never loses track that it's still a comic book movie. In my opinion, maybe one of the greatest looking comic book movies ever. Does the story make a whole lot of sense? Not particularly. Is it especially engaging? No, there's nothing really that new. But the way it's acted and the way it's shown makes it a lot of fun. I wish they didn't have to do this story where he travels to Earth, but it's passable. And any time it's not on Earth, it's really friggin' cool. We do get a few battles in this realm, and we do feel this frustration between the brothers Loki and Thor. And though, maybe kind of awkwardly and over time, Loki does become a pretty good villain. I guess you could still look at all this and say it's still pretty silly, but it's just so epically silly. I love how seriously everybody is taking this. Look at the expressions on their faces, look at these visuals. This looks like something out of some grand mythology. So I guess the best way I can describe it is, if you want to see Thor being Thor, you'll get it. You just gotta wait through some predictable standard stuff. But as that predictable standard stuff goes, it's not as bad as you would think. Is it needed? Probably not. But again, remembering the time period this came out, it's not like everybody was just ready to accept a Thor movie. This was probably the best compromise you could get at the time. The grand stuff is still grand, and it sucks me into its world. Do I wish there was more of it? Hell yeah, but for what I got, I really enjoyed it. Yes, I could have used more action and even more exploration of these worlds, but for what I thought I was gonna get, I was thoroughly impressed. Not the best by any means, but impressive enough for me. Well, if there was any Marvel character I was more afraid not to take seriously than Thor, it would definitely be Captain America. Not only was his design so silly with the bright blue, the giant bullseye, and the little wings on the side of his head, but there was already a movie made in the 80s that looked like it was made in the 70s that, big shock, was not very good. In fact, there's even a Nostalgic Greg review of it. 
So once again, I was a little hesitant to see what they were going to do with this. But luckily, once again, they turned out a pretty good product. Captain America starts off as a wimpy little soldier, conveyed through some pretty impressive computer-generated effects. Not to say it's flawless, but you gotta look really hard to notice. His goodwill and courage convinces everybody that he'd be perfect for a new experiment. One that could lead to a league of superhumans that could stop Hitler and his Nazi thugs. He agrees to the experiment and gets turned into a beefcake. But the scientist is killed, thus he's the only super soldier there is. One of the problems, though, is that nobody knows what to do with him. He's seen as a hero to many, so rather than actually put him in combat, they just kind of put him in advertisements. Big shows, dance numbers, all sorts of good stuff promoting the good of the war, but he's not really doing that many heroics. Finally, they agree to send him into combat, and he does a great job. That is, until he comes across the evil Red Skull, played by Hugo Weaving. Through action, adventures, stunts, and all sorts of great effects, Captain America fights off Nazis and saves the day more times than you can count. Again, not having read that much Captain America, I didn't really know what to expect from this film. And I also wasn't really sure if this was going to catch on in a market where we like things that are new and current, and this takes place back in the 40s. But through some good writing, some fun stunts, and again, some very likable actors, this movie turns out to be a good adventure. Yeah, I use the word adventure, it's not really as much of an action movie. Don't get me wrong, there's lots of fist fights and great stunts, but I don't know, maybe the 40s setting makes me think a little bit more of like Errol Flynn and flying planes and spinning around. Adventure just feels like the more proper word. The director of this movie also directed The Rocketeer, and it really shows. This guy knows how to make the time period look good. They also both star very similar main characters who are not dull, but not the most interesting either. But they're good. They're sort of the typical hero you would see in the 40s. Very simple, but very likable. Naive, but always looking to do good. Even some of the typical cliches are played with a little bit. Like there's a scene where this guy grabs this kid and he throws him in the water trying to escape. He's about to jump in and save the kid, but the kid says, No, go after him, I can swim. God, isn't that refreshing? The Marvel movies really do seem to have this great technique of taking cliches that exist and either playing with them or only taking the best aspects of them. The ones most people are tired of, they kind of say, yeah, we're not doing that. We know you don't like them, and we know you think they're boring, so we're only going to stick to the ones that are classic for a reason. And this one does have a lot of the classics. The bad guy with the disfigured face. The triumphant symbols of America everywhere. The heroic stunts, the mad scientists, all that good stuff. It's lighthearted, but it doesn't steer away from some heavier moments either. When somebody dies, it really feels like they die. And when some characters are separated by a long distance or even time, you do feel legitimately bad. If I do have one major criticism of the movie, it's with the villain. I know it sounds strange, but this is the one thing the 80s film actually did better. That is, when they actually showed it. Through most of the original film, they couldn't show the Red Skull and he looked pretty ridiculous, but when they did show him, he looked fleshy, he looked creepy, he had these beady eyes, he had this great voice. Hugo Weaving is fine when he just looks like a human, but then when he rips off the mask and shows his real face, it looks pretty lame. It just looks like a plastic mask where the other one looked really juicy. The villain as well is kind of a little dull. Not that I remember him being like really annoying or stupid or anything, I just don't remember that much about him. That does seem to be the one weakness of the Marvel films, is while they do a great job portraying the heroes, they don't usually portray the villains that interestingly. I remember Red Skull was a big bad guy, like this was a really intimidating villain. He was the one Captain America always fought. Here, he's just kind of like any bad guy you see in any other movie. Not insultingly bad or anything, just kind of standard. And part of a hero's journey is how intimidating the threat is that he's going up against. So if the threat isn't that intimidating, you don't get as invested. But like I said, he's not horrible, just not anything that great. But honestly, much like Thor, this was a film I didn't think they could really do. I didn't think anybody could take Captain America seriously, but watching it, I actually found myself doing okay. It was clever that they just painted the wings on the side of his helmet. It was clever the changes that they made to his outfit. And it's even more clever that in future movies they would update the outfit to fit the rest of the Avengers. This is a Marvel movie that you can tell is kind of a segue, but unlike Iron Man 2, it feels more natural. It stands on its own as a good movie. It has a good beginning, middle, and end. It has a good journey. It has good character arcs. It has good concerns. If the villain was a little stronger, it probably would have stood out a little bit more. But as is, I was once again really impressed. I wanted to know what was going to happen to Captain America next after the credits rolled. 
At this point, I was finally realizing Marvel is really making traditional comic book movies work. They didn't have to pretend to be anything else or talk down to you or hide behind anything. With just a few cleverly planned out updates, they were making comic book movies that comic book fans have always wanted to see. And even better yet, they were giving a wider audience comic book films that they didn't even know they wanted to see. These films were showing why these stories were successful, why people got into them, why they were worth making movies about. Again, I'm not gonna act like this was the greatest one or anything, but it is the point where I realized, if you truly embrace a world and an environment, you don't need to make as many changes as you thought. And with the end credits advertising that the next big movie was gonna be The Avengers, the ultimate cement of Marvel's staying power was about to take place. So after years and years of build-up, all the hype has finally come to this. The Avengers. There has never been a movie quite like this done before. Six previous films starring individual superheroes that were all coming together for one event that was planned from the very beginning. Though you could look at them as individual stories, they were all leading up to one grand event. This was the event. Now, don't get me wrong, there have been crossovers before, but nothing like this, and nothing this well thought out. So, there was a little bit of a concern. Would it pay off? This would definitely have a good opening weekend, no matter what, it's been built up so much. But would it be the gigantic hit everybody wanted? Would it be as good as the other Marvel movies? Or, as promised, even better, ten times better, something spectacularly huge? Well, the short answer is, yes. Not only was this film a mega, 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 mega hit, but both critics and audiences alike agree it was a ton of fun and worth the wait. The movie centers around the return of the sinister Loki. He apparently is in cahoots with an evil force in space who wants to, what else, take over the world, of course. He plans to do so using a magic scepter to hypnotize people, and a gigantic alien army to open up a dimension and bring him into our world enslaving mankind. Who can stop them? The Avengers, of course! Most of them just having come off hit movies. Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, and even the Hulk, played this time by Mark Ruffalo. But also included are characters we haven't seen that much of, like Black Widow and Hawkeye. And the film, literally from this point on, is nothing but one-liners and action. And I know it sounds strange, but it's actually kind of perfect. When you see these characters together, a lot of them with big personalities just having come off of big movies, what do you want to see? You want to see them interact. That includes working off of each other, talking to each other, getting in fights, throwing insults. And because these actors and characters are so strong and so defined, it really works. The whole movie could be all of them just stuck in a room shooting the shit. And you know what? It'd be okay. They're that interesting and that much fun to watch. But of course, that's not what people are paying to see. They're paying to see action. And when the action gets going, it's some of the most fun I've seen an audience have in a movie theater. Every superhero has a unique way of fighting a villain. And each one has a different personality trait to make it interesting. Well, for the most part, we don't really know Hawkeye yet, but yeah, we're not Avengers 2 yet. Give it time. A lot of these movies, as I mentioned before, deliver a lot of character, but sometimes skimp a little bit on the action, particularly in the climax. The great thing about this movie is that it makes you think it's about to end. They do the big team shot, you think, all right, well, they're just gonna punch out a few more and then we're gonna stop. But nope, it's just beginning. They spend a lot of time fighting creatures in the city and unlike Transformers, you don't get tired of it. It gives you the exact amount you want to see. Every superhero does what you want to see the superheroes do. The Hulk jumps around and smashes things. He punches this giant whale, I don't know what is. Captain America's throwing his shield. Iron Man's flying around shooting stuff. Even Black Widow, who we didn't see that much before this movie, suddenly becomes this really cool character. She actually might be my favorite out of all of them. And yeah, I'm waiting for that damn movie too. The one element of the film that is kinda lazy is the story, but to its credit, story is not what you want to focus on here. This is the first time you've seen all these characters come together and you just wanna see them be those characters and beat shit up. 
so the story is very minimal. Hell, it doesn't even really make that much sense. Loki wants to get all the Avengers together knowing they won't get along and that would somehow destroy them. Okay, well, as Tony Stark himself said, not a great plan. The whole story is kind of like that. There's all these weird little conveniences that don't really add up and are kind of confusing, but really, you don't care. You're there to see the Avengers fly around and be the Avengers, and this movie gives you that in bucket loads. They have been hyping this thing up forever. One of the biggest Marvel teams of all time actually comes to the big screen and it delivers. Does it have that much drama? No. Is there that much thinking in it? Absolutely not. But it's just an incredibly fun, dumb summer film. This is the kind of movie you want to see kind of mindless. You want to see a lot of dumb explosions. But it's done with so much wit and humor that you find yourself enjoying even the silliest moments. It's nice to see a cinematic gamble like this pay off, and for the right reasons. If we just started off with this movie before Iron Man, Captain America, and all the other films, it wouldn't be as good. It'd be impressive, but it'd just be too jumbled because you wouldn't have all the characters defined. Well, now that we do know all these characters and we enjoy them, and they've certainly proven themselves to be entertaining, they come together beautifully. I even kind of find myself enjoying Mark Ruffalo as the Hulk. I'll admit I like Edward Norton just a little bit more because I think he's such an engaging actor, but I like the take he does. He plays it as a guy who's been spending years trying to achieve inner calm. So he kind of looks half awake sometime, but it's actually intentional. It doesn't seem lazy at all, it seems like a guy who's just trying to keep his rage under control because he knows what'll happen with it. And so he sacrifices some of his stronger emotions to keep everything balanced. It would have been cool to see Norton, but this guy's a good replacement. What else can I say? It's The Avengers, one of the highest grossing films of all time, one of the most hyped up films of all time, and it gave you exactly what you wanted. It's silly, it's funny, it's over the top, it's a comic book movie. At no part in it can you say it's not a comic book movie, it just drenches itself in it. And after years and years these were seen as embarrassing films to make, now they completely won us over. And everybody is trying to do exactly what the Avengers did. Create a movie universe, something that can continue and all these other characters can interact with each other and come in and different ideas. They can all try it and some even succeed, but none of us will forget who did it first. Why? Because it was just so damn fun. Iron Man 3, a film everyone agrees is better than the last one, and that's about it. People are split about whether or not this is actually a really good entertaining film, but once again it almost doesn't matter because it stars the person you all come to see, Robert Downey Jr. I'm beginning to think you can put this guy as Tony Stark in Batman and Robin and he would somehow still make it work. But with that aside, does the film actually work as a whole? Well, it depends on the point of view you're coming from. Okay, so Tony Stark is back in his hometown after the events of the Avengers. One major downside though is that now he's getting panic attacks. Yeah, kind of out of nowhere, they try to explain it that, yeah, if you go through this you might get panic attacks too, but I don't know, isn't it a little strange that Tony Stark is getting this? I mean, this is a guy that survived terrorist attacks, he had to replace his heart with this metal light thingy. I know they're trying to add this layer of realism, but that seems a little odd. But whatever, he's being threatened by the terrible Mandarin, the leader of a terrorist organization that vows to take him down. After nearly killing his bodyguard, Tony Stark swears to go after the Mandarin and does the incredibly foolish thing of giving him his home address, on public TV, for all the world to see, with no plan after that. And, big friggin' shock, the Mandarin comes after him and blows the house up. This may be the single dumbest thing a superhero has ever done. There's other good things in the movie, I'm gonna get to it, but I just wanted to go on record saying that is probably the stupidest thing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So Tony is separated from the world and befriends a small child who tries to get him back on his feet. Along the way, discoveries are made, secret plans are revealed, and of course, even more action and crazy technology starts to get going. Okay, so let's once again talk about the good stuff. The action in both Iron Man movies seemed very minimal and didn't always play that much to the strength of the plot. 
Here, it's a lot better. There's not only a wide variety of different action scenes going on, but they're incredibly creative, incredibly funny, and don't seem pointless. Each one advances the story somehow. It's also nice to see that things are kind of stepping up in size. I mean, this is a movie that's coming off of The Avengers. So they know they gotta step up their game a bit, and yeah, they kind of do. There's a lot of suits all over the place, his house is blown up, he has to travel alone, he has to start from scratch again. But it isn't just a retread of the first movie either, where he's captured by a terrorist. It's a different kind of being alone. Even the idea of a child finding a superhero and trying to help him out, that could have so easily been terrible, but they got a good child actor and they wrote him pretty decently, and they spent just the right amount of time on him. You think he's gonna follow Iron Man throughout the entire film and get captured and he needs to save him, but no, he's in the exact amount of time he needs to be in it. But yeah, let's get to the bad stuff. Besides from, like I said, the dumbest move ever done in a Marvel movie, there's this great excitement to see Ben Kingsley as this terrorist fellow, this Mandarin guy. Now, in the comic, he's an alien, and yeah, I guess you can't really do that here, or could you? I don't know, with the Avengers that kind of got away with it, okay? But whatever, I didn't read the comic, so I'm not going to be a purist. However, without giving too much away, what they do to this character is going to piss off a lot of people. This is like the dance in Spider-Man 3 or what they did to Deadpool in Wolverine. This is a complete slap in the face to a character. But with that said, it is funny. It was a legitimate twist I didn't see coming, and it did actually get a few laughs out of me. But again, is that what people are looking for? Probably not. Even though I didn't read the comic, I as well wanted to see the awesome Ben Kingsley go up against the awesome Robert Downey Jr. But instead, who do we get? Some asshole in a suit again! Oh my god, why do these guys keep popping up? Nobody cares if he wrongs someone out of a business or something. It's a comic book movie! Give us comic book villains! Every time you always have in these Iron Man movies, they're either embarrassing, out too early, or embarrassing again! It's kind of like watching a Batman movie where he's fighting the Joker and then halfway through you find out, oh, the Joker was just a hologram. The real mastermind is this guy who wants to get you for tax fraud or something. Who gives a shit? We want to see a comic book movie, especially after one that celebrated what a comic book movie it was with the Avengers. So once again, we're stuck with kind of a half and half movie. On the one hand, the action is good and is visually interesting and there's some fun ideas and Tony Stark is still really funny and they're evolving him a little bit more. But on the other hand, some of these choices are just so bizarre and so strange and just downright dumb. I get the idea behind Tony Stark, he's sort of this tortured genius who has a lot of brilliance but not a lot of wisdom. But come on, some of these moves are just downright stupid. For my money, I'm still glad I saw it. Again, is it technically a good film? Kinda hard to say. I mean, you still get the Iron Man-y stuff you want to see, just a bunch of technology and action and smart-ass lines. But yeah, it is a little weird that the best of the Iron Man movies is the original, and even that had kind of a slow, silly second half. So yeah, I'm glad I saw it. I just wanted to see Iron Man do what Iron Man does, and I was fine with it. But any diehard fans that are looking for that big Iron Man movie, like the big mono e mono fight and such, are probably going to be disappointed when they see what it's building up to. If you're just a typical moviegoer looking for a typical action film, this one's a lot of fun. But if you're looking for the evolution of a character or a story, you, like this movie, will probably have to take a step back. Like most people, I wanted to see a Thor movie that took place in his home turf. No fish out of water stuff, no trying to blend in with any funny lines, just Thor being Thor. But after watching Thor The Dark World, I might find myself going back on that remark. I know I'm kind of an outsider on this, but I'm sorry, I did not see this as a very good film. It just kind of felt like in-between pointless exposition on a character that really could be a lot of fun to explore. In an environment that could be a lot of fun to explore. And when we do finally explore it, it's just kind of dull looking. Really? This is the dark world? The dark world is fucking boring. Really? This is our bad guy who's going to replace Loki? Really? We have this dumbass comic relief again? 
Okay, let me start from the beginning. Some evil jerk who looks like a reject from the new Star Trek movies is trying to capture the Infinity Stones. What are the Infinity Stones? Oh god, I don't want to explain. Just powerful things, that's all you need to know. And it's up to Thor to stop him from getting this stone and, of course, conquering Earth. Natalie Portman is once again roped in, and sadly she gets way too much screen time. More than actually his other warrior friends have. Which is really not fair. I like these warrior friends. I think we need more of them. But instead, not only do we get a ton of Natalie Portman, but Kat Dennings. Good fucking god do I hate Kat Dennings in this movie. I didn't like her in the first one, but at least Thor was on screen. We could see them sort of interact and if she said something stupid, whatever. Thor's there and he's charming and cool. Here, every time she's on screen, she's either alone or with her scientist friends. And she is so beyond annoying. Like, remember in Star Wars where the comedy kind of came from the interaction off of people, like the way Luke Skywalker worked off of Han Solo, and he worked off of Chewie, and Chewie worked off of C-3PO and stuff? It was the interaction. This is the Jar Jar Binks of the Star Wars movies. All the comedy is just put into one person. And just like Binks, she's not funny. Hell, the film opens up with a scientist running around nude. Yeah, they create some sort of bullshit explanation for it, but it's entirely pointless. You don't need it. The comedy is beyond desperate in this. Every line that is trying to be funny, unless it's said from Loki, is painful. Beyond painful. But that's not the only bad thing about it. Remember how grand and huge the worlds looked in the first Thor? Here, they look nice, at least the palace. But aside from that, it's just kind of typical fantasy stuff that you'd see anywhere. Again, look at this dark world. The movie is named after this, and it is so incredibly not interesting. There's a major character who dies in this movie. I remember thinking to myself, God, I should be a lot more invested in this. And I guess I felt bad seeing Thor's reaction to it, but I personally didn't miss the character that much because they just didn't make that person that interesting. Nobody is that interesting in this movie. The villain? What a yawn! The scheme? Seen it a million times! The only thing that's kind of enjoyable is when Thor has to team up with Loki again. This is as great as it sounds. You like seeing these two together. You like seeing them work off each other. But what do they do? Halfway through the movie, they get rid of that idea. And they don't even really start that until the end of the first third. So that's one third of the movie. Hell, less than one third. If this was the prime focus, maybe it would have been a lot more fun. But nope, we gotta make room for Natalie Portman and Kat Denning saying all their stupid, unfunny stuff that nobody wants to see. The movie gives you no time to really settle down and feel like you can get attached to these characters, which is so weird because there's a whole movie dedicated to them that did so well at doing that. Everybody talks like they just kind of want to get the story going. Nobody really relates to each other. Again, with the exception of Loki, but that's in the movie so little it can't really save it. I guess the only other thing that's kind of enjoyable is that the climax does have some creative ideas. It's this device that's kind of like a portal gun and that you can go through a hole and come out another area and can zap you in all sorts of different places, and yeah, they do some cool things with it. But again, did I really care if Thor stopped this guy? Did I really care if he succeeded in his quest? I didn't give a shit. As dumb a setup as the first film was, at least I cared for those people. At least I wanted to see Thor get back home. I don't know, this isn't the worst movie by any means, but it's the time that I felt we could really see Thor being Thor, going out into the fields, or traveling through the stars, or going to the other worlds, just swinging that hammer, doing the cool stuff. Once again, I could see those operatic landscapes really taken advantage of. But instead of feeling like a really grand big comic book, it just kind of feels like a very dull standard comic book. But like I said, I know I'm in a minority, and a lot of people really like this film. I don't get it, and there's certainly nothing in it that's straight up offensive, again outside of maybe Cat Dennings, and weird naked scientists running around for no reason. But my opinion, I'd rather save my money for Avengers 2. So I'm just going to take a wild guess and say the comments in the last video I did, Thor The Dark World, are probably not very positive. I'm also going to take a guess that people are going to say, well, what did you want? What were you actually looking for? Captain America The Winter Soldier is what I was looking for. 
This is a sequel that had a previous film that was good, and did a lot more with its premise than anybody would probably give him credit for. And the sequel dives even further into it. It takes the drama, it takes the characters, it takes the story, and it ups it to 10. When this film came out, nobody was expecting much. Yeah, it looked like it'd be fun. Okay, let's go in, see Captain America kind of do his thing. You know, it's not Avengers, but I'm sure it'll be good. Everyone was blown away by how much work and effort went into this one. The development, the twists and turns, the action. Holy smokes, this is actually a great comic book movie. Captain America returns in modern day Washington, DC, where he finds he's still having trouble fitting in, but not in the ways that you'd think. It's not the tee hee ha ha, what's this thing I don't recognize, it's him trying to deal with the fact that a lot of the people he knew are gone. It actually opens with him visiting his old girlfriend who's mentally and physically fading away. And you know what? It's kind of a tearjerker. This is a woman who was really likable in the first film, has her own show right now, and then suddenly to see her like this, it's sad. You really friggin' feel something for this. But that's not where it stops. S.H.I.E.L.D., it looks like, is being taken over by the same people that tried to stop Captain America in the first film. Nick Fury is dead and the Captain is told not to trust anybody, so he goes rogue. He gets a few people to join him, including Black Widow, and it's a chase to not only outrun S.H.I.E.L.D., but also stop that evil organization, now known famously as HYDRA, while also trying to figure out the story behind their newest weapon, the Winter Soldier. I think most of the people know what the story is behind this guy, but I'm not gonna ruin it. Okay, so this is about as standard a filler in-between plot that you can get. The idea of being chased down by the people you work for is recycled. The evil organization from the first film, literally recycled. A lot of these characters you've seen before, some from their own TV show, yeah, this seems about as recycled as you can get. But again, in this movie, it's not the subject, it's the delivery. The atmosphere and the pacing is so good that whenever there's a new twist or turn, it feels like a big deal. You're surprisingly really invested in what's going on with a character that a lot of people found kind of uninteresting originally. Because it knows what to talk about to make him interesting. It talks about how he has a hard time fitting in. It talks about how he has a hard time figuring out who's on his side and who isn't. It takes the fact that he is such a Boy Scout to its advantage. Because he likes working for people and he likes doing good, the idea that he hasn't been doing good or is going to continue not to do good is something that would make him feel really bad and you would feel the turmoil in that. He's fighting for something you know he would fight for and hey, you would probably fight for too. There's a scene with Gary Shandling that's actually a creepy scene. Yeah, a creepy scene with Gary Shandling. Somehow this movie made that work. And when you do find out who the Winter Soldier is, it creates a lot of emotional baggage. It's interesting because you feel their connection. And that's what this movie does. It takes all this standard stuff and you feel for it. They know the right elements to focus on. They know where to put the emphasis. It's also nice to see Black Widow and Captain America working as a team. Yeah, she still hasn't gotten her own movie, and clearly she deserves it, but if we're not gonna get it anytime soon, the more we can see of her, the better. And she's great, as always. If I did have one nitpick, and it really is a nitpick, I'd say I could have used a little bit more with the Winter Soldier. Don't get me wrong, it's good, but I think because the rest of the film was so strong and I was so invested, I wanted a little bit more of a rivalry there. Now, you do care, but not as much you do a rivalry between someone like Batman and the Joker or Superman and Lex Luthor. And I know, those are different kind of relationships, but those also made the films feel so much bigger, and I wanted this to feel as big as possible because, hey, it kind of got on the right step. This could be one of the great big grand comic book movies. But I think because the relationship can't be delved with too much because of all the other things going on, it sort of holds back a little bit from that. But again, it's a super big nitpick. Everything else in this movie is really, really solid. I'm actually amazed at how good they made this. It clearly was just supposed to be a filler film, but they did their damnedest to make it as amazing as possible. This is taking the idea of a superhero and developing him even more, even one that a lot of people didn't find that fascinating. It took something standard and it made it intriguing. That's what a good sequel is supposed to do. Good action, good story, good characters, it hits everything. Suit up, because it's one hell of a ride.
It's funny. The films I thought would probably be Marvel's failures, Thor and Captain America, everyone kinda knew were gonna be okay. And they were right. However, for me, the film I thought would be okay, but everyone thought was gonna be a failure, was Guardians of the Galaxy. I guess I can kinda see where they're coming from. This is a weird setup. We go from superheroes and super gods to intergalactic fugitives, one being a tree and one being a raccoon with a machine gun. Yeah, it's pretty silly. But I guess I knew it'd be okay because it kind of embraced its insanity. The marketing said everything. This is not meant to be taken that seriously. It's a raccoon who swears. It's a tree that can only say three words. It's a giant gray guy who literally doesn't know what sarcasm is. It's the chubby dude from Parks and Recreation suddenly made to look like a beefcake. This is gonna have a good sense of humor. And it did, and people seem to love it. Though from the beginning, you might think something else. It starts off with our hero named Star-Lord watching his mother die from cancer. She asks him to take his hand, he's too afraid, doesn't grab it, and she dies. He runs out into the field screaming because he lost his mother and suddenly he's abducted by aliens. That sounds like a totally insane opening, and it is, but it's a totally insane film. Years later, he grows up and finds himself living among the aliens as a bounty hunter, treasure hunter, pretty much anything hunter that's usually illegal. But he gets mixed in with a plot from another boring bad guy you won't remember. God, is Loki really your best villain? Why is Marvel so bad at these? And he teams up with a group of outlaws to try and stop it. Nobody was demanding to see this movie on the big screen. Hell, nobody even really knew that much about these characters. But that's sort of what made it so interesting and new. We didn't know these people. We weren't gonna get upset if they weren't represented a certain way, and nobody really had high standards because who the hell's reading a comic about a raccoon with a machine gun? Actually, the real question is, why weren't we reading a comic about a raccoon with a machine gun? But nevertheless, when the movie came out, everyone went nuts. It was one of the biggest hits of the summer, and everybody adored it. And, yeah, I like it too. Did I love it? I don't know if I can say that. I like a lot of the other Marvel movies more, but I think because people's standards were set so low, they were surprised they enjoyed it as much as they did. For me, I thought it was a lot of fun, and funny but I don't know if I see it as quite the big masterpiece that a lot of other people are seeing it as. The plot, once again, is obviously a filler plot. It's talking about the Infinity Stones, it has a throwaway villain, there's a bunch of characters that we're gonna see later. Oh hey, there's Thanos, and he still does nothing. But big one, maybe it's like Winter Soldier and it just does it so well. Well, it does it okay. Again, this is supposed to be a comedy, so it's a different kind of movie. And it does have more sentimental scenes, but they kind of come out of nowhere. Maybe that's the one issue with the movie, is the pacing. Not that it's too fast or too slow, they just don't always segue into each other very well. There's a really nice scene where Groot lights up this room with all these little lights, but it's suddenly an emotional scene in this really big action-packed moment, and it just sort of comes in and leaves too fast. There's another scene where the raccoon is drunk and suddenly starts a fight and we go into a little bit of his backstory and, again, it just kind of comes out of nowhere. They're nice scenes, they just don't always fit in. I'm also not sure why they never made this green lady that funny. Everybody has their own little weird quirk, but she's the only one that doesn't really seem to have anything that funny about her. You could make the argument that she's the sourpuss who's grounded, but we kind of had this big gray guy for that. Well, maybe she's the more emotional center. Well, no, we kind of got Star-Lord for that, so yeah, even though she looks kind of cool, I didn't entirely see the purpose of her. I would have liked something a little extra to make her feel like she's more part of the team. But again, that's kind of a nitpick in what's obviously supposed to be a silly movie, and as silly movies go, I don't know what else to really say about it. It's good. It has good effects, it has good acting, it takes itself seriously at the right moments, and goes for the all-out laughs in other moments. Is it clumsy at times? Yeah, but look at it. It's a raccoon and a tree. I'm surprised we got any of this out of that. I'll admit I don't think I loved it as much as everyone else did, but I thought it was really enjoyable. As goofy intergalactic comedies with a lot of action go, this one's pretty good. It's creative, it's weird, it's goofy, and it's got a lot of punches and explosions. Grab the next ship to the stars and see for yourself.
it's the sequel everyone was waiting for literally since the end credits of the last one, Avengers The Age of Ultron. After one of the most hyped up and biggest blockbusters of all time came out, everyone was waiting what the second one was gonna be. Was it gonna be bigger? Was it gonna be better? Was it gonna be funnier? In some respects, yeah, it is all those things. In other respects, it's kinda hard to keep the wow factor going after such a groundbreaking last one. Does that make it bad? No. Does that make it better than the first one? I... it's... it's complicated. Okay, let's look at the setup. The Avengers assemble once again in order to get Loki's scepter. Huh, they didn't meet up for all those other times the world was about to be destroyed. It's a comic book, don't think about it. But Tony Stark's mind is manipulated by another character called Scarlet Witch, who makes him see a destroyed future that apparently he's responsible for. Like an idiot, he reads it as, I didn't do enough. So he creates this computer that's apparently gonna create peace in our time. Oh, come on. He didn't think that maybe this is what would cause all those terrible things to happen. Because, you know, the audience is 10 steps ahead of him on that. But whatever, he creates this computer program known as Ultron. Ultron, of course, wants to create peace in his time, but in the way that he knows how. By getting rid of everyone. Oops, forgot to overlook that glitch. So now Ultron is trying to destroy the world by making tons of different versions of himself, trying to raise a giant city as a meteor and smash it into the world. And the Avengers have to overcome their new mental problems as well as new physical problems in order to stop him. So yeah, pretty weak plot, but again, the first film had a pretty weak plot too, and that didn't matter. We just wanted to see the Avengers get together and fight and work off each other and say those great one-liners. And in Avengers 2, we get all that. Plus more, actually. There's a wonderful scene where they've all been mentally ripped apart and so they go to this cabin to try and get away. It's easily the best thing in the film because we haven't seen anything like that before. It felt like the Avengers were actually evolving as characters, and through a way that they haven't really done yet. So in some respects, it's exactly what we wanted. But in others, don't we want to see something we didn't know we wanted? like that cabin scene? And don't get me wrong, I love that cabin scene, but why is there only one scene like this in the movie and not more? It's kind of weird because the film does kind of feel like it's on repeat. Here's all these action scenes, all these one-liners, and they're good, they're well done, there's nothing wrong with them, but there's nothing really new about them either. The wow factor from this is kind of gone because there aren't really any new adventures for them to interact off of. I mean, okay, there's this Scarlet Witch and this fast guy and they create this other one called The Vision and at the end they're indicating that there's even more being added to the mix, but all these other characters had their own movies. Half of these people are being introduced in this film and the other ones, they were just kind of side characters. We're not exactly excited to see them here. Now, they're not bad, but they're no Thor, Iron Man, or Captain America. There's also a totally out of nowhere romance between Black Widow and the Hulk, and it's good. Again, not bad, but I'm not exactly gonna lose sleep if I don't see them get together. But again, it is evolving the characters to a different place than when we started. I do feel I found out more about these people after watching this film than I did after watching the first Avengers. That's something that was really missing in the last movie. But with everything else, even if it's done good, the investment isn't quite as strong because we kind of seen this stuff before. A bad guy who doesn't see destroying the world as a bad thing and he tries to make up some philosophical bullshit about why it's not. People being hypnotized to do his will, the whole world about to be destroyed in one city. And again, I hate talking this way because it's done well. In many respects, it's done better than the first film, but it's not evolving anything that much. And don't get me wrong, the audience had a fun time with this. They were laughing, they were applauding, they were gasping, they are doing all the things that an audience is supposed to do. But when it was all said and done, there wasn't this standing ovation like there was at the first film. Because the first film gave us a lot of what we never saw and really wanted to see. This gave us what we thought we were going to see. So it's hard to say, because on the one hand, it is kind of better than the original. We do learn more about these people, there is that wonderful scene at the house. The action is upped, there are more one-liners, we do see a lot more of the Avengers together. Hell, there's literally one scene where they're just hanging out at a party. I could just watch this the whole entire time, they're so interesting. I guess the real problem is, it's not an experience. It's a sequel to an experience, trying to clearly be better, and in some cases it is, but because we've already seen a lot of this before, it's not as much blowing us away. 
but it's still a lot of fun. I definitely recommend it. Does it have stuff that doesn't make sense and are there elements that are clearly filler for other movies? Sure, but so did the first one. I don't think this is the groundbreaking sequel they were hoping for, but at the same time, we didn't get a bad film. By any means. I think if they did want to blow us away, they would include a lot more. Like, why aren't the Guardians of the Galaxy in there? Why wasn't there a Spider-Man cameo? You just got him. Now don't get me wrong, these are all tie-ins that maybe I don't understand. I mean, the fact that any of this is happening in Hollywood is pretty amazing, so maybe they couldn't pull it off. But that's the reason people weren't as blown away. They wanted a lot more, and instead they got a little more. In many respects, I do like this more than the first one. Hell, I probably prefer watching this one to the first one. But it's not the groundbreaking follow-up that I think audiences, as well as the studio, was hoping for. But hell with what it is, and concentrate on what it is. A lot of fun and really enjoyable. If you don't go in overhyped and just want to see the Avengers being the Avengers, this is definitely a fun one to check out. Assemble your team of friends and take a look. Following in the style of Guardians of the Galaxy, that is, taking something that seems totally ridiculous and making it awesome somehow, we have Ant-Man. Again, a seemingly stupid idea that anyone with half a brain would say would never sell, but you put some talented people, some great effects, some creative ideas, and you get a really fun superhero. Paul Rudd plays an ex-con who's just been let out of prison. He wants to be let back in in his daughter's life, but Mother sees him as exactly what he is, an ex-con. He tries to take the route of getting an honest job and standing upright, but his background is sadly not giving him enough credit. So, through the help of his friends, he tries to take on another con in order to get his life back on track. Yeah, you figure out the logic in that. But he gets caught by a scientist, played by Michael Douglas, who's frustrated that his company is working on a weapon that he thought he got rid of years ago. A weapon that can shrink people down but still give them unbelievable strength. Afraid that this technology has fallen into the wrong hands, Douglas talks to Rudd about breaking in and getting the weapon to destroy it forever. Using what? The weapon, of course! A suit that shrinks him down but still gives him unbelievable powers. On top of that, he's also given a device that can control ants as well. It's about as adorably silly as it sounds. With the help of Douglas's daughter, played by Evangeline Lilly, it's a heist movie of both the largest and smallest of caliber. The reaction to this movie when it came out was pretty much the same. Everyone said it was good. Not great, but, but good. It's a movie that we've seen a million times, a heist film, all the superhero stuff, but it's done creatively and uniquely enough that people seem to like it fine. I think I liked it a little bit more than everyone else. I agree with what they're saying, that this has been done a million times and we see the superhero stuff all around, but I feel like there's more effort that was put into these characters than you see a lot of times in these kind of stories. This is a really good cast. They help breathe new life into a lot of these cliches that we've seen over and over, but they deliver it in their own unique and likable way. Even though I've heard this story about how Douglas doesn't want to lose his daughter, and how Paul Rudd realizes that family is the most important, and all this stuff, something about the way they say it and the way they do it, it feels like you're hearing it for the first time. I really appreciate actors that can pull that off. But on top of that, they take advantage of this situation. They make it fun, they make it visually interesting, and you really feel the size of this person. The idea of being shrunken down has been done a million times, and honestly, when I heard they were making a movie out of this, I was thinking, oh god, another Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, this is so done to death. But again, they add new elements on top of it. The fact that it is a super suit, the fact that he can get bigger and smaller whenever he wants. The fact that they can make anything they want bigger or smaller. They make keychains, toys, all sorts of various things gigantic. And it's great, it's wonderful to see. The climax actually takes place on a Thomas the Tank Engine Railroad set. That's both really funny and really action-packed at the same time. Again, it's taking kind of a standard idea and it's adding a new spin to it. I love how Marvel can do that. It feels like no matter what subject matter they're doing or talking about, they can add something that's unique to it. Whether it be a writer or a style of acting or effects, they always add that element of cool. So I like this movie, actually even more than most people like it. Is it an action classic? No, and it's no kind of masterpiece, but I was invested from beginning to end, and I want to know what's going to happen in the sequels. 
The idea of this guy joining the Avengers sounds like a really good idea. I love to see how he interacts with everybody. Hell, I love to see how all these characters interact with the Avengers. Maybe that's how I judge a really good movie, that when it's done, I don't want to be done with it. I want to see even more with it. I want to see more explored. I want to see more of these characters. I want to see more of their interactions. I want to see more things get bigger and smaller. I want to see more of those creative action sequences. So I definitely had a lot of fun with it. Shrink yourself down and experience it for yourself. It's arguably the most popular film of several past generations, Star Wars. What can you say about a franchise as huge as this? Well, I can say I was introduced to it by the Ewoks. Yep, the Ewoks cartoon is what got me into watching these movies. Actually, even that's not even true. The Ewoks cartoon got me into watching the Ewoks movies that went to TV, then that got me into watching the actual movies. The reason I bring this up is that I didn't really have much hype for it. Nobody said, this is a cinematic masterpiece, it's one of the greatest movies ever made, it's phenomenal. Granted, I did see images from it all over the place, but for the most part, I discovered it myself. And like a lot of people, I not only greatly enjoyed it, but found great value in just how many levels it entertained on. Kids could watch it, adults could watch it, you could tune in for the action or read into the symbols, admire how new it is, but also cheerfully paying homage to, laugh and cheer while also analyzing what a very detailed mythos it is. The story, as I'm assuming most of you know, is about an evil empire that's taken over the galaxy and wants to finish off the last of the rebellion. A rebel spy named Princess Leia hides the plans to destroy their newest weapon called the Death Star with two droids named R2-D2 and C-3PO. They come across a farm boy named Luke and a magical hermit named Obi-Wan. They realize they have to get these plans to the rebels, so they come across a pilot named Han Solo and Chewbacca. On their way, they get snagged by the evil empire led by the sinister Darth Vader, and end up trying to rescue the princess while also destroying the evil weapon before it destroys them. Okay, so what can I say about this film that everybody hasn't said before? Well, for one, it's not perfect. Which I know doesn't sound shocking nowadays, but for a time before the internet, that was something you almost never said. Everybody loved Star Wars and thought frame by frame was just the ultimate masterwork. But as much as I love it, you gotta admit some of it's pretty corny. Actually, a lot of it. But in the best way. The acting at times can be a little hokey. Remember Princess Leia's weird British accent? Or Luke's ear gratingly whiny voice? Or Solo's constant complaining? Yeah, watch it again and tell me you don't pick up on some of this. On top of that, some of the dialogue can be pretty lame. Like when Leia tells the villains she should have noticed their foul stench when she was brought on board. Um, snap? There's also a billion plot threads that don't make sense, but I kind of let those go because, eh, it's fantasy, and that's never what the focus of fantasy really is. The magic doesn't lie in the details, but in how many different ways it can speak to you, as well as several generations. And that's what Star Wars does really well. As cliched and hokey some of these characters can be, we all relate to them. The wide-eyed Luke Skywalker, the cynical Han Solo, the wise master teacher, the villain with a past. It really is clever in how much it takes from certain stories from fairy tales to folklore to Kurosawa to Stanley Kubrick, and even Flash Gordon. In fact, a lot from Flash Gordon. Throw in the special effects of 2001, but mixed with the pacing of, say, a James Bond movie at the time, and you have something that was very unique. It explains all the areas you want to know about and keeps vague the areas you don't want to know about. The Force is a perfect example of that. It's the magic energy that flows through us all and can help people if they know how to use it. That can be anything. It can be religion. It can be Taoism. It can be the power of God. It can be the power of the mind. There's so many ways you can interpret it. The beauty of the film is in its simplicity. But with that said, there is a lot of detail in the techniques. The effects at the time were groundbreaking and done for not a very big budget. It just took a lot of time, energy, and devotion, as well as pretty good actors interacting off of them. For as simple as these archetypes are, and yeah, sometimes as awkward as they can be, you still connect with them very quickly. We don't know much about Darth Vader yet, but by God, James Earl Jones' voice gives him such a history. You can tell this is a guy who means business because he's been through a lot, and all of that just comes through the voice. And the seriousness that everybody takes this dialogue that a lot of other people would kind of see as silly adds a surprising credibility to this world. A world that creates an environment that both seems very simple, but somehow complex at the same time. Sure, it's silly, but it's endearing. 
and puts a lot of thought in the areas that you want to put a lot of thought into, as a lot of good myths do. Is it one of THE great myths? Well, I don't know if I can go that far. I'd still say probably check out a lot of the traditional ones to get an idea of what great storytelling is. But for the film industry at the time, and even you could kind of argue today, you don't really see that many myths. At least, not new ones. And not one that captures so many of the important elements so creatively and with such fun. Yeah, I know, I guess I'm saying what everybody says about this movie, but I can't help it. It's good. I really enjoyed it as a kid, and I really enjoy it now. Okay, I can't quite join the group and say it's one of the greatest things I've ever seen, but it has definitely left an impact on me, and for the right reasons. For me, it was a gateway to other myths. An introduction to simple storytelling that can lead to vast worlds. And I appreciate it greatly for that. I see its flaws, but the stuff that's good is just too clever to overlook. I don't know if it's the stroke of a creative artist, or a jumbled mess that accidentally turned out something great, but it's a lot of fun to both watch and analyze. I can see why they show it in film classes and analyze it here and there. Is it overplayed? Sure, do we praise it too much? Probably. But it's a great starting point for opening up to more great stories. So grab your lightsaber, get into your X-Wing, and may the Force be with you. How do you top one of the highest grossing, most seen movies of all time? You give it a sequel that doesn't do the exact same thing over, but instead continues the story and in a dark, dark way. The Empire Strikes Back is often said to be the best of the Star Wars trilogy or really any of the Star Wars films, and yeah, they're pretty much right. We open once again with the Empire seeking out the Rebels, led again by Darth Vader, as Luke gets a message from a deceased Obi-Wan that he is to seek out Yoda, the Jedi Master that taught him. After being attacked by the Empire, Luke separates from Han and Leia in order to find this master Jedi and learn the ways of the Force. While learning these new ways, the rest of the gang takes shelter in Cloud City, a place ruled by Lando Calrissian. But little does everybody know that the Empire has an evil trap for all of them, especially for Luke, who Vader has a keen interest in. It's so refreshing that the sequel to one of the highest grossing films of all time is actually doing something a little different. Not just different, but taking chances. The pacing is slower, the imagery is darker. It wasn't telling the story like it was a sequel, it was telling it like it was the second part. In fact, this was the first time on the big screen they actually put episode 5 on there, with Lucas revealing this is now a six-part movie series. Why start at number 4? Who knows, but people were enjoying it so much, they didn't care. They just figure he could do no wrong. Which, <laughs> well, we'll get to that later. Everybody likes this movie for different reasons. Well, actually, that's not true. They all like it for the same reason. It's darker. There's more drama. It leaves you on a cliffhanger. It's taking this happy-go-lucky adventure that we had with the first one and making it much more gritty. Me, personally, I like it because it took the very basic good versus evil story and started to gray it out a little bit. I think most people know the big surprise in this film, but I'm not going to give it away in case you don't. I will say, when it was revealed, I didn't see it coming, but my mind wasn't quite blown like everyone else. I actually kind of thought to myself, yeah, that sounds about right. That solid line of good versus evil, black versus white was suddenly being blurred, and it was actually very welcoming. As much as we love to say the dark side and the light side, this suddenly made it a little bit more interesting. It didn't always have to be the cowboy with the black hat and the cowboy with the white hat. You could get a little bit more three-dimensional with it. And speaking of which, the movie really does seem more three-dimensional. A lot of it is spending time diving inward. We have a romance blooming with Han and Leia, we have Luke trying to figure out how to use the Force. There's a lot more symbols and foreshadowing in it. It went a direction I think a lot of kids didn't see coming, and hell, even probably a lot of adults didn't see coming. But that's great, because it just got us more invested. The effects, once again for the time, are still pretty damn incredible. The puppet work on Yoda, even though, yeah, he does look like a Muppet, still feels very much alive. The eyes, the expression, the moving of the wrinkles on his brow. It's the same as watching Kermit the Frog. You know he's not real, but he feels real. He will later be replaced with a CG Yoda in the prequels, and even when he looked the most realistic, you never got the impression he was really there. You got the impression Obi-Wan was looking at nothing. Here, you never feel like Luke's just talking to a guy holding a puppet, you feel like he's talking to Yoda. 
And it's not just the use of a great practical effect, it's the use of great writing and acting. All of it plays a part. I also love how much more menacing they make the Empire in this. Not that they were not threatening in the original, but good god, Vader just went from this guy who sort of stood in the corner to this monstrous beast. Whenever he comes out with that lightsaber, you feel the intimidation. You feel like you're gonna lose to this guy. This is when he suddenly went from just being a cool bad guy to one of the greatest villains ever. He could lunge at you and rip you apart, but he could also stand perfectly still and destroy you. He can be very patient and intelligent, but he can also be stubborn, killing anyone he just doesn't like. It's a brilliant depiction of someone you love to be afraid of. The movie also goes much more into the philosophy of the Force, but again, not too much. It talks about what it is, but not how it is. It talks about the experience, but not why you're experiencing it. About feeling it, but not touching it. And again, it's not all done in dialogue. There's a great scene where Luke just goes into this area in the swamp and comes across Vader. We know it's not really him, it can't really be him. And yet the fight takes place and he sees his own face inside the mask. Those are the exact right choices that have you say, Oh my god, what does that mean? What can it mean? It gives you just the right tools to build your own conclusion. Again, as good storytelling should. So yeah, like everyone else, it's my favorite out of the Star Wars film. Are there still details that don't make sense? Sure, but it's the same as the first one. You overlook it because the rest is just so good. And you know that's not the focus. The focus is to be sucked into this world and its characters. And most of the people who watch it are. It's more intense, more suspenseful, more visual, more philosophical, more dramatic, more of what you've come to love. The Force is strong with this one. It's the final in the now very poorly named Star Wars trilogy, Return of the Jedi. Everyone says this is the least of the original three Star Wars films. Not bad, just not as good as the other two. And honestly, I think it gets a little bit of a bum rap. Not to say the criticisms aren't right, it's just the stuff that's good in it I think is a lot better than some of the stuff in the other films. But does that make it better than the other two? Well, let's take a look. Han Solo is kept captive by the evil gangster Jabba the Hutt. Luke, Leia, and Lando all try to sneak in to break him out, but they get caught themselves. After several fight sequences and battling a bunch of monsters, they eventually escape and make it back to the Rebellion, where they find out the Empire is once again building another Death Star. Only this time, the leader of the Empire, the Emperor, will be on there for them to take it down. So the team tries to take down the shield generator that's on a nearby moon, while the rest of the fighters try to fly in to blow it up. The team on the moon comes across inhabitants called Ewoks, while Luke separates from the team to confront the Emperor and Darth Vader himself. Can the Rebels take down the evil Empire once and for all? And will Luke ultimately find himself turning to the light side or the dark side? A fitting setup for a finale, but the biggest problem everybody has that I have to admit I have too is that there's way too many detours. The opening sequence with Jabba the Hutt and breaking Han Solo out, it goes on forever. There's a moment you can end it where Luke destroys this big monster, but no, they had to drag them to another monster for him to destroy. Truth be told, you could cut everything having to do with Jabba out of these movies and you would miss nothing. Think about it, you could have Han Solo captured by anybody. Hell, you don't even really need to get rid of him, that's just sort of leaving it open for a cliffhanger. He could have been with the team, he didn't have to be sent away. Honestly, the Ewoks play a bigger part than the job of the HUD scenes. I know that sounds crazy, but really think about it. The Ewoks help take down the Empire. They play a part, they serve the story. And it also makes a well-intended, if not immaturely done message, of nature versus technology which is in a lot of stories and myths. So why do we put up with those Jabba scenes so much? Well, to put simply, Jabba's a cool character. He's this big, fat slug that just does whatever he wants. It's kind of the American dream. He's a gangster, and he gets away with it. So why do so many people hate the Ewoks? Because one, we already saw a ton of puppets and we're getting sick of them. Second, they're little teddy bears, and after the last film where everything was so dark and gritty, what, we suddenly got a bunch of little teddy bears? This is feeling more like a toy commercial. In my honest opinion, if you wanted to fix this, Jabba should have been on the moon. Cut out the opening, save him until halfway, have him capture Solo, wanting his money back, but then when he finds out the Empire is in his territory, then he decides to fight him off and help the Rebellion. How much more fitting would that have been? 
Jabba would have been both the bad guy and the good guy at the same time. And he would have had a purpose. And oh my god, wouldn't it be so cool if you saw Jabba's people attacking those stormtroopers instead of Ewoks? Also throw in a pointless motorcycle style chase, an all too similar retread of the destroying the Death Star in the first film, and little teddy bears throwing rocks, and yeah, you can see how a lot of people would see this as the lesser of the films. But with that said, not only are these some of the best effects that ever came out of the movies, but it has some of the most dramatic moments. The scenes where Luke is confronting Vader and the Emperor are some of the best in any of the movies. The guy they got to play the Emperor is perfect. He's old and frail, but by God, he has such presence and this deep, crackling voice with these yellow eyes. It's almost something out of The Exorcist. At times, his acting can be a little goofy, but it's goofy in just the right way. He's taking a risk that you're in such a dark, uncomfortable mood that you're just going to accept that this is creepy. And for the most part, it works. The whole atmosphere is just so dark and so brooding and so shadowy, you just feel like you've descended into hell. The minute Luke walks in as their prisoner, the Emperor just gets rid of the handcuffs. Like, yeah, we know there's nothing you can do here. And the longer it goes, the more we dive deeper and deeper into the darker side of Luke's anger, of Luke's rage, and the visuals all support it. The pacing supports it too. There's a fight going on, but it's also very psychological. The music, the atmosphere, the acting, the dialogue, everything, it's perfect. It's about as pitch perfect a scene you can get in any Star Wars film. But does that make up for the other little mistakes in the film? Probably not. But like I said before, even though a lot of it doesn't always connect, it's cool. The scenes with Jabba are cool, and yeah, I'll even say the Ewoks are not as bad as everybody says they are. It led to some okay jokes, and I like the idea of wood trampling steel. By the end, when everything wrapped up, it just kind of felt right. When you see the final scene in the Ewok village, you just kind of go, yeah, you know what? This is a good place to stop. Everybody seems happy, everybody seems in the right place. Were there flaws? Sure, but just like there were flaws in the other films too. I guess I just don't get when everybody says this is the light-hearted one when there were such dark and gritty scenes in it. Some of them the best out of any of the movies. So yeah, is the first film technically told better? Yes, but I still stand by the third has some of the best moments out of any of them. And like I said, it's just a good ending. Not the best, but still pretty damn impressive. And for a while, this is all Star Wars fans thought they would ever get out of this. But little did they know that so much more, good and bad, was awaiting them in the future. What can I say about the most despised movie prequel in cinema history? Well, I can say this. Who has two thumbs and totally saw it coming? This guy. That's right, I've been waiting years for these bragging rights and now it's finally come. I knew from the first trailer that this was going to be a bad movie. It just kind of came down to logical deduction. Lucas only directed one Star Wars film. And as impressive as it was, it had a lot of problems. The writing was hokey, the acting was stilted, and there's a lot of things that didn't always make sense. But he had a lot of people to give him advice and limitations, so it still turned out a good product. Then, years later, after barely directing a thing, this guy is suddenly supposed to direct a masterpiece? Though, in all fairness, even I couldn't guess it'd be this bad. It starts off as Obi-Wan and his master are trying to figure out some sort of political taxation federation stuff that, yeah, like you, I can't figure out either. They try to help the newly elected child Queen Amidala, which you don't elect queens and queens can't be children, but whatevs. And along the way, they come across the death of comedy, Jar Jar Binks, and the death of acting, Anakin Skywalker. Anakin, it turns out, is a virgin birth. Yeah, can't get any more obvious than that. And according to a blood test, apparently the force is very strong with him. Oh, the amount of people this pissed off. Oh, we'll get to that later. They buy Anakin from one stereotype to deliver him to two other stereotypes, who are in cahoots with a senator named Palpatine, who is secretly the Emperor, who wants to get the Queen to sign the treaty because... political stuff. We get sword fights, gun fights, space battles, and through all of it, I have no idea what they're fighting for. But who cares, right? In the original, it was just an evil empire. We didn't really know their politics. They were just kind of evil. So maybe we can just do the same thing here, right? 
Well, that would work if the characters were the least bit interesting. And by god are they not. My complaints are your complaints, the acting is so wooden, the writing so fifth grade, the effects way too computer generated, the comedy way too kindergarten, the stereotypes way too offensive, yeah, what else can I say about this that every other person on the planet hasn't said? Well, I guess I'll try to defend it a touch, as everybody acts like this is the worst thing ever made, and it's not. It's just a bad movie coming off the heels of some of the most popular films ever made. As tiring as the constant CG gets in this, there are a lot of very neat landscapes. The worlds are very creative and very beautiful to look at. The sword fights got a lot better too. Remember when Darth Vader and Obi-Wan were just kind of tapping those light sticks together? Well, now this is a straight on battle. And it looks amazing. It's still impressive even years later. And whether you see it as a good thing or a bad thing, there is something interesting watching a guy's dream suddenly come to life with nobody getting in the way. It's a fully realized vision with no filters whatsoever. And as someone that loves film and artists, it's interesting to see. It just so happens it's not very good, but it's still interesting. Was this always planned from the beginning? Probably not, but it's also kind of neat to see the changes he'd want to make, and yeah, what happens when a filmmaker stays away from his craft so long? I can't even make a small argument for the midichlorians. It's been proven that a lot of people that seem to have a spiritual essence or a lot of energy, the water in their blood is affected. So in a very slim way, you could kind of make the argument that this is credible and doesn't get in the way of the philosophical and religious aspects, but even I admit it's very, very slim. I'm just trying to offer an interesting point of view. But yeah, like everyone, I thought this was a turd also. The story's too complicated for kids to follow, and the dialogue is too childish for adults to follow. So unlike the original three where it's booked to both, this one speaks to neither. I'm hearing more and more that there are a lot of kids that grew up with this because, hey, they like Jar Jar, they like poop jokes, and they like a lot of the visuals. Which is interesting when you watch them grow up and realize that the original three films were much better than this. Honestly, the most entertaining thing about this film is the fan reaction. The fact that people waited days in line and then were in such denial when they found out it was bad. They didn't even admit it was bad. They tried to bargain with themselves and be convinced that it was actually good, but over time, nobody could defend the poop jokes. Nobody could defend the racial stereotypes. As much as critics at the time actually tried to say this was a good movie, yeah, look up the reviews at the time, they tried to defend it, it showed in full view the power of hype and how long it took for so many people to admit the Emperor has no clothes. Honestly, in many respects, it's kind of an important movie for that. It shows that artists are flaw, and there is no perfect project. Hell, even the original Star Wars had a lot of stilted acting and hokey dialogue. For a lot of fans, this was the bursting of the bubble, the ending of the fairy tale, the having to face real life. But there's advantages to that too. It tells people that, hey, you don't have to be perfect to make good stuff. You can learn, you can change things, you can make stuff better. Even your heroes aren't always your heroes. And that's okay, you can be inspired to do better work. If you're one of those people that claim Luke has killed your childhood, you never had a childhood to begin with. Or you're constantly trying to stay in it and reject your grown-up world. Bottom line, he got his vision made. And it sucked. But at least he got it made, exactly how he wanted it. It still did well at the box office, so you can't claim it's a waste of money. But yeah, after years of spin-off books and spin-off games and so much that was be done with the Star Wars universe that Lucas had little involvement with, did I expect a lot more? Oh yeah. But it's still such an interesting turnout in how strange and awful it is that it's kind of something to analyze. We'll never know, was it just too many yes men, or was he away from filming too long, or was he never really that talented to begin with, it was just other people that made it work? It's one of the great mysteries that's fun to speculate. And if you like it, great! I wish I could have such an innocent mind not to see all these offensive stereotypes. I'm sure he thought he was doing some sort of clever commentary, but if you don't see how this movie can piss off a lot of people, enjoy it! You're definitely part of a rare minority, and don't let anyone take that away from you. But for me and a lot of other people, it's as if the voices of millions of people cried out in terror, and were suddenly never given their money back. So 
Although, despite what you may think, even though I really didn't like Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, in my opinion, is the worst. Why? Because not only was so little learned from the mistakes of the first film, well, okay, there's a lot less Jar Jar, but this one is just straight out boring. It is dull. It's not very interesting to look at, it's not very interesting to listen to, the stilted acting is still there, the bad writing is still there. There's tons of things in the plot that don't add up, which wouldn't matter if I gave a shit at all what was going on, and I don't. Even Phantom Menace had the advantage that it was spectacularly bad, bad on such a big level. This one is just a boring meh. Anakin Skywalker has grown up and apparently has yet to develop a personality, as he apparently comes across Amidala, who is now not queen. Uh, another election, I guess. But nevertheless, he's assigned to protect her after a few assassination attempts. The two eventually end up falling in love, but this is a big no-no, as apparently Jedis can't fall in love. Well, that sucks, not sure why that is, but whatever. While their incredible chemistry is being formed, Senator Palpatine makes a decision to form a clone army. These will eventually become the Stormtroopers that have different voices in the later films that I think they're talking about actually replacing with Australian voices. Ah, oh, never mind. And they're gonna take out more of that political nonsense you couldn't follow in the first movie, except this time Christopher Lee is in it. Well, that's cool, I like Christopher Lee, but what's he doing there? What's his evil plan? More political talk that you can't follow. And honestly, that's about it. They try to fill up all these other things going on, but it's not interesting, and since you can't really follow the political talks or the war talks or anything like that, I don't really know what it ties into what's supposed to be important. We get a little bit of Anakin being separated from his mother, but he just kind of says he's upset and angry, and that's about it. There's not any more diving into it. The romance is kind of similar too, they just kind of say they're in love over and over and find really corny ways of saying it, and that's it. You never feel any chemistry out of them because the acting is so stilted. At this point, I was starting to realize it wasn't the actors being chosen that was the problem. Now, don't get me wrong, some of them can actually do okay. Ewan McGregor is actually a pretty good replacement for Obi-Wan. Christopher Lee is always a lot of fun, and of course, Palpatine is always great. Actually, I'm just realizing. It's all the Brits. The British people are the only ones that give great performances in these movies. Even in the first Star Wars films, Ford and Hamill are a little whiny, but with the exception of James Earl Jones, it's all the British people that add the credibility to the movie. Maybe that's why Carrie Fisher tried to do the British accent. But regardless, what I'm getting to is that unless you have a really, really good actor, it's hard to make this dialogue sound natural, and you have to put a lot of trust in your director that what you're doing sounds and looks good. And I think we've established that Lucas has been out of touch with being a good director for a while. So yeah, I can't really blame the actors for how terrible they're reading these lines, they're hard lines to read. And if someone is giving you the direction to make it sound more and more bland, you're gonna just do it. One of the only things people really remember out of this film is the lightsaber fight with Yoda. People either seem to love or hate this, and yeah, I'm somewhere in between. I understand both sides of the argument. On the one hand, yeah, it is kind of neat to see Yoda with a lightsaber. It's cool to see him jump around, and it shows that such a little person can still cause a lot of damage. But like the other half of people, I kind of like the fact that all he had to do was wave a hand and a spaceship could fly by. Like he was that powerful, all he had to do was just point a finger. He was that in touch with the Force. I don't know, I'm just glad it was something I didn't really see before, and it was kind of neat to see. It'll be it, kind of goofy. But trust me, that's nothing compared to the other goofy scenes in this. Like a 50s diner in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, this isn't like the cantina on Mos Eisley where it's like, oh, it kind of looks like a bar, but it's still kind of its own thing. No, this is just a diner designed a little differently. Did Star Wars have the 50s? Come on, there still has to be something otherworldly about it. Not just, oh, take a diner waitress and make her a robot, boom. And in the grand scheme of things, my brother brought up a really good point. He said, what is the point of this film and the last one? After seeing Revenge of the Sith, I realized there really isn't any. You could just watch Revenge of the Sith and you can figure out everything. That Anakin was in love, that he was emotional, that he wasn't ready to become a Jedi. Everything you needed to know was not that one. These two films were completely pointless. No character is developed, the political talks are impossible to follow and not very interesting. There is no real insight into anything. And between the two of them, this one seems the most pointless. It's forgettable, it's dull, it's not even that creative. You can't even really enjoy it for how bad it is. Well, 
okay, some lines, but it's still mostly just a drag. Oh, yeah, that line makes it in the movie too, from C-3PO. Oh, it's so stupid! Anyway, if you want to rip it apart and nitpick it, there's more than enough material, but in my opinion, if you can't even say it's so bad it's good, this is the Star Wars movie you can easily skip. So out of all the Star Wars prequels that came out, this was the one that felt the closest like a Star Wars movie. It opens with Star Destroyers and a space battle and lightsabers and going in and rescuing people and running through the ship and shooting lasers and... Yeah, this is Star Wars and it's easy to follow. Once again, the focus is on the simplicity of the character. You understand why Anakin is angry. You understand what he's going through. Now, does that make up for everything? No, it's still, by definition, a pretty bad movie. But this is the first time watching it where I said, you know what, I'm glad I saw a Star Wars prequel. There's just enough good things and inside and visuals that made me glad that I paid the money to go see it. It's a few years later and Anakin finds out that Amidala is pregnant. This is already big trouble, but it's going to be even bigger trouble when he has a vision showing that she's probably going to die at childbirth. But he's becoming more chummy chummy with Palpatine, as he tells him that the ways of the dark side can actually find a way to save her life. Slowly but surely, Anakin is being won over to that side as Obi-Wan goes to do more of that political sword fighting nonsense that's in the other films, but it's not as focused on here. The focus is what it should be on, Anakin. And I think most people know what's gonna happen. He's gonna become Darth Vader, things are gonna go wrong, there's gonna be a big separation between him and Obi-Wan. But this is the first time it plays out closer to how you may think it's supposed to play out. There's betrayal, there's manipulation, there's big sword fights, there's explosions, there's student against teacher, the ultimate failure. And yet there's still so many other dumb scenes. Like when Anakin does turn. As everybody says, it's way too fast and out of nowhere. It's one thing to say you want to learn the dark side to save your loved one, but to kill so many people to completely switch sides and kill young ones or younglings or whatever the hell they're called. It's completely out of nowhere and the acting's not strong enough to support it. But out of all of them, this is probably the most visual storytelling. You could watch this on mute, oh hell, I almost recommend it, and still get an idea of what's going on. It felt more like we're in the Star Wars universe, like it has a history. The scene at the opera where he's giving the backstory and the mythos? That's one of the best moments I've seen in any Star Wars movie. And everybody, whether they're doing a good job acting or not, look the part. Anakin looks amazing. This is what you would imagine a young, angry Darth Vader would look like. But yes, like I said before, I make fun of the moments you make fun of too. Darth Vader shouting, "No!" The stupid romantic dialogue that feels so forced. The plot threads that don't add up. I make fun of it all too. But at the very least, I finally got something that felt a little closer to what these prequels was supposed to be. It is dark, it is brooding, it is gritty. It has big battles and manipulation that you can actually follow this time. Truth be told, it's a movie I don't mind popping in every once in a while. Do I laugh at the stupid scenes? Sure, and do I still point out all the things that don't make sense? Yeah. But the fight scenes and the cinematography and the way it visually tells its story is really, really interesting. By no means perfect, I don't even really think you can say it's good. But it has good things in it, some of them the best out of any of the Star Wars movies, and it's hard for me not to recommend that. The first one's interesting to watch to see just how bad it can be, but you don't really need to see it in order to figure out what's going on here. And the second one is a complete forgettable mess. This is the first one where I felt like I actually learned a little something. Or at least, what the intention was. I didn't feel the emotions, but I felt the idea behind the emotions, if that makes sense. It's a tough call. If you want to see the movie to know a little bit more about what was supposed to be going on, it's interesting. But if you want an actual good movie, I still can't say that it is. But at least it was finally feeling like Star Wars and looking like Star Wars, even if we had to put up with a lot of dumb bullshit stuff. I think you can figure out if this is something you would benefit from or if it would just piss you off more. And for a while, it seemed like this was the end of the Star Wars movies. 
but literally and figuratively, a new hope seemed to be in the future. It's time to talk about those controversial special editions, and when I say controversial, I mean geeks complaining about stuff that's clearly not important. But we're geeks, it's what we do. In the mid-90s, George Lucas re-released the Star Wars films on the big screen, which was a big deal. A lot of us never saw it on the big screen, so this was something really wonderful to see. And on top of that, he updated a lot of the effects, added new scenes, and gave it a total digital cleanup. People freaked. They couldn't stand the idea that he went and changed up something that was so perfect. How dare you touch even one frame of this? Everything about it is absolutely magnificent. How dare you? My take on it? I actually think it's kind of cool. It's kind of nice to see a little bit of an update. It was also a clever way to get new and younger audiences into the seats. Yeah, I don't like it either, but you know there's a lot of younger people out there that say, Oh, the effects, they look fake now, so I don't like it. And on top of that, Lucas said this was the version he always wanted to see. This is a world where there was no limitation. He could show much more of Cloud City. He could show much more of Moss Eisley. He could have a bigger dance number in Jabba's Palace. And some of these really work, and some of them really don't. For example, when you first see Moss Eisley, it's neat. You get a lot more different angles and see a lot more creatures running around, but then they literally put creatures in front of the camera. There's little robots going by and these giant dinosaur things. You literally can't see what's going on. Why would you do that? You're missing an important scene, the first using of the force in the entire thing. But it's hard to make out because there's this dinosaur's butt in the way. It's totally nuts. But then some things are really neat to see. Like they shot a scene of Jabba talking to Han Solo in the first film that was later replaced with the Greedo scene because they felt the technology wasn't able to do it yet. Well, now it can, uh, sort of. The first time we saw him was neat, but he did look kind of fake, and suddenly he had these perfect lip movements. Well, that's weird, because in Return of the Jedi, it's still a puppet with his mouth moving up and down, but now he can form perfect syllables? They would later do another special edition where they replaced him again, this time with the mouth moving up and down, but he looked even worse! He still didn't look like he was there, and he looked so incredibly fake! And on top of that, the scene is pointless because they leave the Greedo scene still in there, so Jabba is just repeating what we already heard. And with that said, yeah. Let's talk about the whole Han shot first thing. In the original version, Greedo has a gun on Han Solo, and Han Solo shoots him to get out of it. Well, Lucas didn't like that, so he had it where Greedo shoots first, and then Han Solo shoots back. Now, taking out the fact that this is a horrible looking effect, it literally looks like they just photoshopped Harrison Ford's head over a little. Everyone once again went nuts. That's not how it's supposed to go. Han Solo's supposed to shoot first. It's a total betrayal of his character. Everything that Han Solo is, is destroyed because of this one scene. Okay, it's stupid and not needed, but it's literally one second. People are still bitching and moaning about this dumbass scene, and it's ridiculous. They act like somebody told them that Luke Skywalker was a Jawa or something. It's not that big a deal. It's a different take on an already popular scene. Neat, it's cool to see a new point of view. Why the hell is this worth going ape shit over? Yeah, don't worry, soon the prequels will come and suddenly you'll have nothing to complain about. This will still be the most offensive thing you will ever see in a Star Wars film. In Empire Strikes Back, the changes are a little bit more minimal, but look nice. Cloud City, for example, you can see a lot more of. And they even explain some things that were a little confusing in the original. Like when Lando Calrissian gets on this little microphone and says everybody evacuate the city, what, wait a minute, where was that going to? You never see who's hearing it, you just kind of assume it's that one building. In the special edition, you see it's a speaker that reaches out to the entire city. But then again, does he just have a little microphone like that anywhere? Couldn't anyone get on that microphone? And details, details. You also see a lot more of the monster that attacks Luke in the opening. And you see how the hell Vader got from Cloud City to the Star Destroyer so quickly. Yeah, that always bothered me in the original. It's like he was in one location, then suddenly he's in another. Here, we actually see him take the ship and go back. It's a little detail, but it's nice to have. Jedi, most of the changes are good too, but there's still a couple of things that are a little too crazy. The dance sequence in Jabba's palace, for example, goes from this muddy, dark, dirty place to this big musical number, and there's a lot of moving and dancing, and it's just a little too childish for me. 
On top of the fact that, again, the CG monsters never really look like they're there, but whatever. Again, it's neat to kind of see a new point of view. We also see a planet at the end that we never saw in any of the other versions, but would later be in the prequels. Yeah, remember that planet that's entirely a city? You see it here. And on top of that, if you look closely, you see a statue of the Emperor falling over. That's actually a nice little detail. So when they first came out, I didn't mind the special editions, and I still don't. It's neat to see a brand new angle on a lot of this. And it's cool that an artist gets to go back, revisit his work, and touch it up a bit. Honestly, I'm not even against the idea of constantly going back and changing things up. Yeah, it's a little weird and you should probably leave good enough alone, but at the same time, effects do keep changing and they do keep updating. I kind of like the idea of comparing different special editions and seeing which effects hold up better, how far we're coming, or how backwards we're going. Some of these CG effects look so much better, but then some of the practical effects looked a lot better. I kind of like comparing and contrasting. So the idea of constantly going in and updating it, I don't mind. What I do mind is that we can't see the original. That's where I think people can get legitimately upset. We should be allowed to compare and contrast. Why are we just ignoring history? If Abraham Lincoln released another version of the Gettysburg Address and said this is what I really wanted to say, that'd be neat, I would love to see that. But if he went back and said, no, this is what I said and what you heard is completely false and doesn't exist, I'm gonna erase it, that would be stupid. And for years, Lucas never allowed the original versions to be seen. After the VHS of the special editions came out, that was then the only version you could get. When it went to DVD, it was the special edition again. Except there were even more changes in it. Yeah, now Hayden Christensen is at the end instead of Luke's father. Well, wait a minute. Why isn't that Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan then? Why isn't that younger Yoda? I get the idea of wanting to bookend the prequels and the other films, but this makes no sense. But again, the biggest problem is we weren't allowed to see the original on Blu-ray or DVD or any of that. It's like Lucas was ashamed of the effects, that they weren't up to where they could be at the time. But they were groundbreaking, they were amazing. They're still impressive to look at. Sure, they're a little bit more fake now, but again, it's neat to see the evolution of a project. In my opinion, you can make as many changes as you want, as many versions as you want. I think it's a lot of fun to look and compare them. But if you don't have the original, you can't see what got everybody interested in this to begin with. You're denying newer generations what the older generation saw and got sucked into. However, I do hear that the original versions are being released now if they haven't been already, now that it's out of George Lucas's hands. This is definitely a good thing, as we deserve to see more than the VHS version of the original films. So on the whole, I like the special editions. Not everything about them, and some things I think are downright awful, but I think it's kind of cool to see someone mess with their own work again. But as long as we have the original to always go back to, I don't see the fault in it. I don't care if you call it canon or not canon or version 2.56, whatever. It's neat. It's like seeing an artist go back and sketch an old drawing that he did, seeing how his style has changed. Take it for what's worth, find which version you like the most, and give it a watch. Everybody knows the Muppets and everybody loves them. But after a few films that didn't do so great, suddenly the Muppets became really unpopular. Okay, nobody hated them or anything, but they definitely weren't pulling in all the numbers. Once in a while you see them on a commercial or two, but they weren't really in movies or shows or anything like that anymore. This is why the reboot movie called The Muppets was such a big deal. Not only were they trying to get people interested again, but they threw as much time and effort into it as possible. We're talking big musical numbers, celebrities, emotional moments, new material mixed with old material, commercials and advertisements everywhere you went. And thankfully, it paid off. Not just because it was really, really funny and creative, but because it was brilliantly and brutally honest about people's acceptance of The Muppets recently. Two brothers named Walter and Gary, one of them kind of obviously adopted, are going on a vacation to Los Angeles. One of the reasons being that Walter's biggest dream is to become a Muppet. But he finds out that the Muppet studio is about to be closed and bought up by an evil tycoon. So he rushes to get all the Muppets back together to put on a great big show to raise money to keep it around. The problem is, all the Muppets have gone their separate ways. Why? Well, because nobody cares about the Muppets anymore. 
Yeah, they're pretty harsh in hammering in how not popular they are. But Walter still believes in them, as does Gary. Well, sort of. He really just wants a vacation with his girlfriend Mary, but also wants to help his brother out, and yeah, you can see the obvious problem here. Will they be able to put on a show and raise enough money so that they won't lose the studio? Oh, what do you think? Well, oh, actually, it doesn't turn out exactly how you think, but in a way it kind of does, but in some ways it's really clever, in other ways it's kind of a cop-out, but okay, that's a whole nother video. Let's talk about the movie in general. The movie is a send-up to the classic traditional Muppet films, like the Muppet movie or the great Muppet caper or Muppets Take Manhattan. The comedy is straightforward, but also strange, simple, but with a lot of fourth wall jokes, and does a wonderful job at combining old tricks with new tricks. Classic humor with more modern humor. But that's only what makes it good. What makes it great are the emotional moments. This movie will make you feel sad that you ever didn't look at the Muppets. There are so many song sequences and moments of them just remembering the good old days. Trying to figure out what went wrong. Did they go south or did the people just leave? Something like this can get a little too heavy handed, but they do it at just the right balance. Every single time they have a song trying to remember what happened, there's always another song that's very upbeat and funny and again, kind of like the classic Muppet movies. It's this kind of clever directness that makes us appreciate them so much more. When they get set up to sing the Rainbow Connection, it's a big tear-jerking scene. But the great thing about it is that it doesn't all rely on nostalgia. There's new stuff as well. The new songs are really great. Hell, one of them got nominated for an Academy Award. The new techniques are great, combining modern-day technology with, well, still the fact that they're foam puppets. And it's a good combination. They feel alive. They feel real, even though we know they're obviously just hands in foam. But their personalities are still so strong and so likable that you just totally overlook it and accept the madness. Is it flawless? Not really. There are a few nitpicks. For example, there might be one too many songs. I remember one sequence that Chris Cooper has. I just remember scratching my head saying, what is the purpose of this? It's not especially funny. It doesn't further anything. It's just kind of a weird detour. Now, don't get me wrong, most of the Muppet movies have weird detours, and yeah, I kinda had a problem with that too. Doesn't mean I don't have a problem with it here. Also, I get the idea that they want Walter to look more human, but I don't know, I think he's a very unimaginative looking Muppet. They had him around for a while, but then when they did the new Muppet show, they didn't even include him in that. He's by no means a bad character, he's just kind of a bland, wide-eyed innocent. He's needed for the story, and he's fine, he's just not that unique. I also don't like that his talent at the end seems to rip off Malcolm in the Middle, but hey, everybody's ripping off Malcolm in the Middle nowadays. But probably my biggest issue is the ending, and I'll do my best to talk about it without giving anything away. It looks like they're gonna go in this one direction, this direction that isn't the 100% happy ending, but it's kind of the idea that we'll move on, we'll get past this, we're still a family, we're still close, we'll still do great things. I thought that was really inspiring and a great angle, but then at the last minute, literally during the credits, they just retconned the whole whole thing and there's the 100% happy ending they were just saying they weren't gonna do. That drives me nuts. Why did they have to go that route? They could have done something really new and really different. But does it really ruin anything? I don't think so. It's just sort of an ending that I wish could have been a little different. The majority of the movie hits all the marks it's supposed to hit. When you're supposed to laugh, you laugh. When you're supposed to feel sad, you feel sad. When you're supposed to enjoy a really energetic song sequence, you do. When it's supposed to be slow and dramatic, it pays off. When it's supposed to be fast and energetic, it's really enjoyable. I really like how the writing and the direction and the jokes are so similar to those first three Muppet films. Yet it isn't just a mindless retread. They throw in new stuff as well. It's a really, really good balance. From soothing song numbers to pointless celebrity cameos to looking right in the camera and making a joke to the audience, it's the Muppets and they're right back on track. If you loved them at their best, you're definitely gonna love them here. After the success of their first film, The Muppets Return in Muppets Most Wanted. A movie that literally takes place directly after the first one. Yeah, you see them waving and saying goodbye and then suddenly they're just jumping right into the sequel. I love movies like that. If you wanted, you could just edit them together as one big film. That takes a very strange detour halfway through. It's still funny. The Muppets are back at the Muppet Studio, but it looks like trouble is a brewing. 
as an evil criminal who happens to look exactly like Kermit, breaks in, switches them up, and now he's confused for Kermit while the real Kermit is thrown in jail. Yeah, they're doing that cheesy story. And again, even the Muppets acknowledge they're doing that cheesy story. Walter and a few others start to catch on, and they try to figure out what's the best way to stop this criminal mastermind, while also getting Kermit back safely, while also convincing everybody that this guy is not the real Kermit. Standard, oh yeah, but funny? Incredibly. Where I felt the last Muppet film was very much trying to be similar to the first Muppet movie, this one is definitely trying to be like the second Muppet movie, The Great Muppet Caper. Some people didn't really like that because they like the emotion of the last film, and in this one, it's not really there. But it's not supposed to be there. This one is just returning to the straight-on jokes and clever writing, catchy song numbers and goofy sequences, and they all work. Honestly, my favorite Muppet film out of all of them is The Great Muppet Caper. Even though I love the emotion of the other ones, I just thought the comedy and the creativity of that one were so great. It was just so spontaneous and odd, but also so entertaining. This one, I felt the same way. Where the first one has some problems that we overlooked because the emotional moments were just so good, this one I think has a lot less. Most of the jokes hit bullseyes, and a lot of them you don't see coming, and a lot of them really do try serve a different humor while also staying to the traditional humor that the Muppets are so well known for. It's combining old cliches with new cliches. And there's still all those pointless celebrity cameos and all these weird song sequences that just come out of nowhere. The music and lyrics are incredibly clever. So I was kind of scratching my head why people weren't getting as into this one as they did with the first one. That is to say, I don't know anyone that hated the movie, but people were either on, eh, I didn't think that much about it, or it was okay. The only thing I can gather is that the first film, while it did have more problems, took more risks. The emotional moments in the first one could have very easily bombed or been awkward or just didn't pay off, which would have caused people to not only dislike it, but really dislike it. But because they took that risk and it worked, a lot of people got a lot more emotional to it and they connected as something much bigger than the other Muppet movies. This one is a very standard Muppet movie. It's really nothing but jokes. Even the plot is kind of one big joke. For me, I don't mind. That's kind of like what the traditional Muppets were. But for others, they might be wanting something more. Hell, even in the opening song, they acknowledge that sequels are usually not as good as the first one. To me, that makes me laugh, but to others, it might be like they're kind of admitting that they know this one's not going to be that great. And that can put them in kind of a weird feeling throughout the rest of the film. For me, though, I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. I do admire the chances that the first film took more, but in terms of what made me laugh harder, that'd definitely be this one. So I guess it's kind of a pick your poison. If you're going for more of the mix of the emotional with the laughs, that's definitely the last film, but if you're just going for straight up comedy, this is definitely the one to check out. I loved it just as much as the other Muppet films, and I know I'm gonna see it a lot more times in the future. Okay, so a little history. If you're younger and you're watching this, you may notice that when you go to the video store, or hell, if you still go to any video stores, you'll see a lot of Disney sequels, like Cinderella 2, or The Little Mermaid 2, or Lion King 2. The reason for this is that there was a time when hand-drawn animation was dying. I mean, okay, you could argue it's not really around much anymore, especially cinematically, but Disney was losing it big time. Most of their films were not making money, so they did a lot of direct-to-DVD sequels. And most of them were pretty bad. This is worth mentioning because one or two actually made it to the big screen, and in this case, it's Return to Neverland, the sequel to one of Britain's most beloved children's stories. When it came out, it was pan. The critics hated it. Everybody said it's just another direct-to-DVD movie just thrown on the big screen given a little bit more budget. It's a waste of time. So that's the movie I was waiting to see, and honestly, I don't think that's what I got. Okay, it's not great, but it was actually a little better than what I was expecting. Kinda? Sorta? Okay, well, it's years later. Wendy is grown up and has a family of her own, but unfortunately, it's during wartime. Oh yeah, we're going there. Not only is Wendy's husband going off to war, but it also looks like that her children, one being the main character Jane, are about to get sent away because of the bombings. Jane has forced herself to grow up faster than most children because of the obvious situation. While Wendy still tries to tell stories of Peter Pan in imagination, she just can't seem to get into him anymore, and understandably so. 
But that all changes when one night, Captain Hook returns, kidnaps Jane, and takes her to Neverland, mistaking her for Wendy. But Peter Man finds her and saves her, and thus, she tries to figure out how to get back home using her logic and not really knowing how to use her imagination. So the Lost Boys have to learn how to be more reasonable, even allowing a first Lost Girl, and she has to learn how to be playful and creative, all while avoiding the evil grasp of the pirates. The major criticisms that everybody makes about this movie is that it didn't need to exist. And they're right, this doesn't need to exist. The first Peter Pan is fine exactly how it is. Both the book and the play hint that there's other adventures that go on, but it's not something we always necessarily need to know. I guess for me though, I grew up with a show called Peter Pan and the Pirates. It's a show not a lot of people know about, but it was damn good. It explored Neverland, it explored the characters, and it treated it very, very seriously. Yeah, did that need to exist? No, but I would have missed out on all these great adventures. Return to Neverland kinda has a similar feel. Except in the Disney universe. It's still clearly the Disney Peter Pan and the Disney Captain Hook. In fact, the voices they got to replace them are amazing. They sound just like the original actors. But that doesn't mean anything if there isn't a good story to go along with it. And this story, yeah, has a little bit of the liar revealed elements to it, but it doesn't focus on them that long, and all the other elements they kinda take from the original book. For example, there's a scene where Jane says she doesn't believe in fairies. I sort of rolled my eyes and said, oh yeah, well we all know what this is because of the first movie. Wait a minute, they didn't do that in the first movie. We also have the manipulation of Hook with Wendy, except this time it has to be Jane. But this was a great scene too, because it showed that Hook could be very clever. He wasn't just a dumb pirate who waved his sword around, he actually did have a little bit of a mind. And the struggle Jane goes through is a very understandable struggle. You see the war, they show you some of the grittiness. I mean, okay, not too far, they don't show dead bodies or anything, but they show it's tough. She isn't just a stick in the mud, you completely understand why she has this mindset and why it's hard for her to imagine things. Heck, why it's even hard for her to be happy. Now with that said, there definitely are things you can complain about. For example, they have pop songs, oh yeah, and they really don't fit. There's one song that the Lost Boy sings that sounds like a traditional Disney song, but aside from that, all the songs are sung by pop singers, and they're early 2000 pop singers, so they have this scratchy voice that's supposed to sound tortured, and it sounds like shit. It sounds like shit. It's awful. It's distracting. It's a slap in the face every time there's supposed to be an emotional moment. I hate it when they do this with Disney films, especially ones that take place such a long time ago and in fantasy lands and you just hear this incredibly dated 2000 song and ugh, it hurts every time you hear it. Also the voice actress for Jane is kinda hit and miss, sometimes she really gets the lines right and other times it sounds a little forced, but it's nothing too distracting. There's also some weird changes that I never quite got, like instead of the crocodile they have this giant octopus or squid, something like that, and now he's the thing that chases Captain Hook. It's funny and it's still animated well, but why didn't they just do the crocodile? They just say he's gone, but why? This octopus thing does the exact same thing, I don't get why they need to switch it out. But for the most part, what they do switch out or keep in is actually kind of welcome. And besides, that's not the focus. The focus is on Jane interacting with the Lost Boys and trying to get back her childhood. Which, yeah, sounds a little familiar, right? I guess if you do have to compare these two, I would say Hook is the better movie, but... I don't know, for a sequel to Disney's Peter Pan, this is kind of exactly what I would expect. It has some really nice imagery, like when Hook is taking Jane to Neverland, this ship is flying through London. It looks amazing! There's a wonderful scene at the end where young Peter Pan meets grown-up Wendy, and it plays out exactly how it should play out. It's not too emotional, but it's not too simple either. And that's kind of how I think of the movie. If you're looking to find problems with it, you won't find any shortage. You can definitely find things that don't quite work, or maybe you've seen in other movies and such. But if you legitimately want to see a sequel to Peter Pan and you want to know what happens, I think this is a very delightful adventure. I was really surprised, I was not expecting to like this film, I thought I was gonna hate it like all the other critics did, but I actually kind of enjoyed it. It's not grand or epic, but it's simple and nice. Did it need to be made? Probably not, but since it does exist, I think it's fine. I think kids can watch it and get a lot of laughs, and adults can watch it and enjoy some of the more emotional moments. It felt like the people making it enjoyed the subject matter and weren't forced into doing it. They appreciated the magic and the imagination and the humor and the artwork, and they wanted to do something very similar. And in my opinion, they succeeded. I guess it's not a favor for a lot of Disney fans, but for me, I have no problem believing in fairies with this one.
Hey, you remember Wicked? That Broadway show that took the world by storm by looking at a popular story and giving it a new point of view? And everybody has been trying to rip off in one way or another recently? Well, now we have Disney's version! Uh, one of many. But this is one that actually takes place in Oz too. It's Oz the Great and Powerful. An imaginative take from director Sam Raimi, who mixes imagination and wonder with awkwardness and a lot of clumsy choices. A magician, played by James Franco, wants to make a name for himself by doing great things, but he just can't seem to get off the ground. Well, one day he literally gets off the ground with a balloon, gets sucked away into a storm, and wakes up in the land of Oz. He of course comes across some interesting characters and some interesting baddies, and he tells everyone that he is in fact a powerful wizard. By using his illusions and his salesmanship, he convinces everyone he can do great things, and for the most part, everybody believes him. But soon an evil witch, played by Rachel Weiss, tries to use his tricks to her advantage while also using her sister, played by Mila Kunis, by manipulating her romantic interest in him to fulfill an evil plot. Okay, so what are the good things? Well, as you'd imagine, especially being a Sam Raimi film, it is very visually interesting. Some of these backgrounds look a little repeated, like we saw this in Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland or Lord of the Rings, but then you get some really cool scenes, like the opening is done in a different aspect ratio. This is obviously supposed to be very similar to the trick they did in the first film where it starts off in black and white and then it goes to color. Not only does this start out in black and white, but it's not in widescreen. And even when it's not in widescreen, they use the 3D effects very cleverly. Like when someone shoots fire out or throws a hat, it actually goes outside the boundaries. And it works more to its advantage when you travel to Oz and they go to widescreen and you see how vast and gigantic it can be. Sometimes, I have to admit, it does kind of capture the spirit of the original Wizard of Oz. There's a wonderful scene where he comes across this little china doll and tries to glue her back together. Everything about this scene is, gap, for lack of a better word, magical. It's just a magical, wonderful little moment. The music, the pacing, the acting, the effects, the effects are unbelievable here. You really feel like this thing is alive. It's a really charming, tender moment that I really wish the rest of the film was like. But sadly, it isn't. It just kind of feels like some choices were made that shouldn't have been made. James Franco can be an unbelievably good actor, but he seems kind of miscast here. I feel like there should have been someone a little older or a little bit better at being a fast talker. He just kind of looks like a guy who's trying to play a con artist, not an actual con artist himself. The whole film, as you probably imagine, is building up to the classic Liar Revealed story, and I hate these stories, I think we're all so sick of it. I think we put up with it more if tons of creative stuff was coming, and yeah, there are some really creative scenes. But story-wise, it goes the route you think it's gonna go, and yeah, the whole time you're watching it, you're thinking, huh, wasn't this done a lot better in Wicked? And speaking of which, let's get to the ultimate blunder in this movie, Mila Kunis as the Wicked Witch. Oh lord, this is a good actress, she can do good stuff, but this is completely the wrong choice. It's like having William Shatner as Hamlet or Leonardo DiCaprio as The Mask, just some things don't go together and you know they're not gonna go together. But you kinda hope it's like Michael Keaton and Batman, like everyone thought it wasn't gonna work but maybe it'll play out, maybe the director saw something that nobody else saw, but no. The makeup is ridiculous. The voice she has isn't dramatic and it isn't intimidating. It just looks like a little girl dressing up for Halloween and screaming, I'm the Wicked Witch, believe me, I'm the Wicked Witch. It's hard to watch, like really hard to watch. And like I said, this is a good actress, she has tons of other work to her credit, this just isn't gonna be one of them. The majority of feedback I hear on this movie is mostly really negative. Like, people not only dislike this movie, they hate it, they just thought it was the pits. While I think some scenes are, I can't quite go that far. The Liar Revealed story is painful, but the rest of the setup I thought was actually kind of clever. If given a little bit more focus and a few different choices made, I think this could have been actually a really good story and a downright really great film. But as is, kinda like the Spider-Man movies, they're well intended and creative and visually interesting, but they're just kind of awkward. The moments that work are really great moments, the ones that don't are just kind of uncomfortable. I guess I wasn't expecting that much, I mean I wasn't especially excited for this movie, so maybe there wasn't as big a disappointment for me. I'm still glad I saw certain scenes, I like some of these creative characters, I like when they're flying in the bubbles, I like when he's putting the china doll back together, I like some of this imagery. 
but clearly some of these casting choices should have been moved around. Some of the dialogue could have been a lot more clever. The pacing in some moments could have been a little tighter, which leads to an obviously good intentioned, but still clumsy movie. If you're in the mood for some good visuals and a couple of nice scenes, I say this isn't that bad one to check out. But if you're in the mood for something that's much more complete and put together, I say you're probably going to need a lot more glue. You know, every Christmas I try to review a good Disney Christmas movie. Well, you know what? I'm sick of it. This Christmas, I want to review crap. Uh, this looks good. Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas. This is one of the earlier Disney sequels that was coming out, like maybe the sixth or seventh. God, it's sad to think that number is actually early. This must have been really popular because they even re-released it with a special edition. Yeah, I guess this got a bit of a fan base. I guess to its credit, it's not the worst. I mean, there's definitely a lot more bad Disney sequels out there, but... Yeah, it's still not that... Eh. Okay, well, it takes place once again, once upon a time. Except this time, Belle and her prince are talking about who brought Christmas back to the palace. So we flash back to when Belle was still a prisoner of the beast. He's still pretty kind to her in terms of letting her roam through the castle and everything, but he has this hatred of Christmas. One of the reasons being, I guess they are all transformed on Christmas. Huh, what a coincidence. And they even come across this Christmas ornament, played by Bernadette Peters, who hates Christmas as well because she hates what a reminder it is of all the misery that it's brought. But of course, Belle wants to bring Christmas to the castle by going out and getting a tree and celebrating the holiday. But little do both her and the Beast know that they're actually being manipulated by this evil organ played by Tim Curry. Oh yeah, now things get good. Tim Curry is the villain in this, and he doesn't really attack or throw anything at people. Well, not until the end, but we'll get to that. He just uses his manipulation to keep the Beast shut off from everybody so he can do nothing but play music for him. I guess on the whole there are a few good ideas here, most of them being around Tim Curry. The design of this organ is amazing. He's all CG, but he looks incredible. This is something that clearly should be CG. The film also looks very nice. Well, okay, it's pretty impressive for the animation that they had at the time. This was before they just abandoned their film animation and threw it all into their DVDs. But this was kind of a nice halfway. It wasn't as lame looking as Return of Jafar, but it wasn't as good looking as, say, Mulan 2. They still have some nice winter environments, they know how to shoot the snow, they know how to get some good colors in there. And I guess if someone was forced to do a Christmas Beauty and the Beast special, this is not the worst story you could put to it. I kinda like the idea of keeping the beast away from everybody, and the organist kind of being like this addiction, trying to keep him in his loneliness. In fact, he actually kind of likes his new form, and he wants to stay in that new form. Isn't that fascinating? But aside from that, it's not much. Belle goes from being a really interesting character to just always kind of being happy and smiling and optimistic. A little too much. She becomes a little too bland. It's nice hearing Bernadette Peters sing, but hell, anytime she sings, it's amazing. One of the problems, though, is that the songs are very half-assed. That is to say, I'm sure someone worked very hard on them, but all of them sound like melodies that just weren't given enough time to really bloom. They're all kind of searching for a sound, or searching to be the next Be Prepared, or Beauty and the Beast love song, and yeah, they just sort of sound like cheap imitations that weren't given enough time to be those songs. There's also this completely pointless climax where it looks like everything is gonna end, but out of nowhere the organ decides, No! I'm gonna stop everybody! I'm gonna destroy the castle and j Oh, what the hell are you doing? I give it credit that it could have been a lot more half-assed. You get a feeling that the people working on this are kind of shrugging like, okay, well, if we have to do this, let's try to put something decent together. But with an idea this strange and this forced, it's really hard to turn out anything that spectacular, especially after this was such a spectacular movie with the original. It's a pretty damn tough follow-up. I guess I'd say if you're very forgiving of story and characters and you're just kind of looking for some basic Christmas visuals that aren't spectacular but are good, this is harmless. But yeah, coming off the heels of the only anime film at the time that was nominated for Best Picture, you'd probably expect something a little better than this. 
But then again, it's a direct-to-DVD Christmas special. What can you expect? I wasn't impressed, but I wasn't horrified either. There's plenty of stupid moments, but there's some okay moments as well. In my opinion, there are so many Christmas specials out there that do this kind of stuff so much better that it's definitely worth looking at those instead. If you got the nostalgia factor, fair enough, go ahead and watch it, it's not gonna injure you any. And hey, if this is what gets you in the holiday spirit, who am I to judge? Merry Christmas, and I'll see you through the rest of December. After the surprise enjoyment of Return to Neverland, a kind of good Disney sequel, I was suddenly reminded of the bad Disney sequels with Jungle Book 2. By no means an awful movie, but definitely a 100% completely pointless one. There is no reason to continue this story. There is no reason to see these characters again. The first one ended on a perfect note. Mowgli goes where he's supposed to go, and the animals go where they're supposed to go. So if you're gonna do a sequel to this, you should make it really interesting. Hell, even the original book had a sequel, and it's very, very interesting. In fact, it's downright depressing. But seeing how the first film barely followed the book, I was expecting this one wouldn't either. Not only was I right, I was really disappointingly right. Mowgli is still a little boy and still in the man village. A family decides to take him in, he even manages to get a little bit of a romantic acquaintance. That is, as much as boys like girls at that age. But he finds the jungle is still calling him. So one day, after getting in a fight with his family, he suddenly out of nowhere feels like he doesn't belong and decides to run away, and thus finds Baloo, Bagheera, and all his animal friends. His girlfriend decides to chase after him, but little do they all know that Shere Khan is back and wants revenge from Mowgli humiliating him in the past. Will he slice into ribbons while they sing Bare Necessities a minimum four times? Oh, how I wished. As some of you know, I wasn't really the biggest fan of the first Jungle Book. That is to say, it was good, it was fine, I just really wish there was a better rendition of the story told. But it's okay, it's passable. So obviously in the sequel, they try to relive a bunch of scenes that you remember from the first movie. Look, there's Ka, look, there's the elephants, look, there's the vultures. And that's really about it. The only things that are kind of new in this is the opening and the ending. The opening where you see Mowgli in the man village, which honestly could have been developed a lot more. I think it's a little too happy. And the ending where there's a climax in the ruins of an old temple. That was neat for a bit. But aside from that, it's literally just going from character to character, scene to scene, saying, Hey, you remember this? You remember this? Yeah, I do remember this. In fact, I can just put on the first movie to watch it. They just go from one distracting song to another distracting song. Actually, not even a different distracting song. Most of the time, it's just bare necessities. The romance between Mowgli and the girl isn't very interesting. The new characters they do introduce just seem kind of pointless. I get the feeling this was intended for little, little kids. And I guess as a story for little, little kids go, it'll entertain them for a bit. But again, it's Disney, and it's the Jungle Book. Don't you think a little bit more time and effort would go into the development of this? I mean, on a technical level, it's not bad. The animation is still really nice, especially on the human characters. The voice actors are good choices, with Haley Joe Ozma as Mowgli and John Goodman as Baloo, as well as Tony Jay playing Shere Khan and Jim Cummings as Ka. These are all good replacements. But it just makes you feel all the worse that's being wasted on a story that just has no reason to be. Nothing is discovered, nothing is really furthered, it just kind of goes back to what you did in the first film. And even then, I don't think I'm giving anything away here, he just kind of goes back to where he belongs, which, yeah, that's kind of what happened in the first film, wasn't it? With Disney doing another live-action remake of this story, and it looks like they're gonna stick to the animated film once again, it's such a shame to think we will never see a movie version of this book that's supposed to be like the book. I just never got, outside of the Chuck Jones short, why we never got this version on the big screen. It's interesting, and kids would watch it, and adults would watch it. It's the one time a dark, gritty reboot would be totally welcomed. But as someone who thought the first film was okay at best, this one just left me completely empty. And I think most people forget it immediately after they watch it. I feel bad because there's obviously a lot of work and talent that went into making it, but unless you do something new or interesting, I think I'm gonna stay out of the jungle for a while.
always so split when it comes to Cinderella. Some say it's a charming fairy tale, others say it's an incredibly sexist story. I guess I'm somewhere in between. I mean, yeah, did Cinderella really have to stay with that family? Could she have left at any time? Yeah, probably. But if the story is done right, you focus on the things that are the most important. Like how being hopeful, patient, loving, and a hard worker can finally pay off. This is the idea they were trying to do with the new Cinderella that, in my opinion, doesn't really come across. The story still seems basically on track. Cinderella is a young girl who has a father that she loves very much, but he tragically passes away, leaving her with her stepmother and stepsisters. The three of them don't like Cinderella and immediately start to treat her like a slave. Trying to be optimistic, she obeys all their commands, hoping one day to accept their love, but she's slowly starting to realize it's never gonna happen. She bumps into a young man, who happens to be a prince, and they start to hit it off until they find out their situation and realize that they're probably never gonna be anything more than friends, if even that. But the father wants the prince to marry, and so they hold a great big ball for him to socialize. The stepmother and stepsister don't let her go to the ball, but of course, a fairy godmother comes and shows her the way. Through kindness and magic, she transforms a pumpkin into a carriage and her rags into a beautiful dress, her shoes into glass slippers, and she's off to the ball. She once again hits it off with the prince, but she needs to leave, resulting in one of her slippers being left behind, and thus the maiden who can fit the slipper will marry the prince. Sounds pretty standard to the traditional Disney formula, but there are a few changes. Some good, some bad. Let's talk about the good stuff. Seeing how it's a Kenneth Branagh film, once again, it looks amazing. The colors, the sets, the cinematography, it's like you're really in a fairy tale. There's a lot more detail given to characters that didn't get much attention in the original that sorely needed it. For example, the prince is much more fleshed out. Yeah, he isn't just a bit of hunk arm candy, he's actually a very interesting character. As is the king. And even the stepmother has a little bit more development, as we actually see her and the husband try to get along, try to have a little bit of a life together, but realize that they're not quite meant for one another. So you see the seeds of how she would become so despicable. It's also kind of interesting seeing the development of Cinderella starting off as the stepdaughter, then slowly becoming the maid. They don't just immediately say go to the kitchen, they say, oh, wouldn't you like to help out? Wouldn't you like to make things easier? Leading to a point where they don't even let her sit at the same table anymore, which is the scene where she finally breaks down. It's emotionally effective. You really feel bad that she will never be a part of this family. I also kind of like the idea that the fairy godmother is disguised as a peasant, but then when Cinderella treats her with kindness, that's when she gives her the reward. A good lesson, but isn't the idea that she's being rewarded for kindness all through her life? It's kind of weird that she suddenly gets all this stuff just for treating one person in a good way. But whatever, you get the idea. Honestly, the film in many respects does do a lot of good updates, that is except for one element that is kind of an important element, and that's Cinderella herself. If you watch the interviews, they all talk about how she's not a damsel in distress, and she's not a waif, and I really hate it when they do that because it's like, okay, we know what she's not, what is she then? The answer is, not very interesting. Ironically, in trying to make the character more strong and independent, they actually make her more submissive and more dependent. In the original cartoon, her father dies when she's a child, so it makes sense that she would be used to this way of living, that she's supposed to be the servant. Here, he dies when she's practically an adult, so it doesn't make any sense why she wouldn't just leave. In fact, there's a scene where friends are asking her, why don't you just leave, and she's like, oh, it's my father's place, I would feel bad. That makes no sense! And she ends up leaving at the end anyway, so it makes doubly no sense. And when it does show her childhood, it's some of the worst stuff in the movie. It actually starts off showing how over-the-top pleasant her life is, and it is painful. It is beyond sappy. It's like it's made for three-year-olds. Which, if the movie was made for three-year-olds, fine, but it's clearly not. It's supposed to be made for everybody. It's supposed to make adults feel like children and children like adults. Just know if you're watching it, the first couple minutes is not a reflection of the rest of the film. And following that over-the-top happy childhood, she herself is also over-the-top happy. There's one scene where she finally breaks down, and it's a very welcome scene, but all the other times, she just kind of smiles and looks pleasant. And I'm sorry, that's not interesting. I know a lot of people remember the original Cinderella as being just very bland and not very interesting, but you know what? She had her limits. She could get angry. She could get frustrated. You could see in the animation and the performance that she's constantly telling herself, just get through it, just get through it. So when it leads to the scene where the dress is ripped apart and she has nothing left, it's genuinely heartbreaking. In this movie, when they rip the dress apart, it doesn't mean a thing. Yeah, she cries and she feels sad, but it feels like we're going through this simply because it's the Cinderella story. We kind of got to go through it. It didn't feel earned. 
We already had the big cry scene when she realizes she isn't part of the family, and it was very effective. But because of that, you're taking away from a moment that should have been huge because you did it a little too early. On top of that, there's a scene at the end where she's locked in the attic. Now in the original, she tries to get out. She's banging on the door. She's calling for help. In this one, she's just so happy thinking about her prince and also somehow so sad that she thinks nobody would want to see her that she does nothing. She just spins around singing to herself. Oh my god, this is supposed to be the stronger, more independent version? A good strong character is supposed to work with their flaws. You're supposed to see what their problems are and see them work through it. The original Cinderella is trying to work through a mindset that she's had since childhood and see that she is worth the effort. She's worth breaking out, she's worth going behind her stepmother and stepsister's back. Here, much more than the original, she waits for someone to come and save her. In the original, she's at least making an attempt to get out. I'm sorry, these are big problems with this character. So, does that make it a bad movie? Uh, kinda. I mean, it is called Cinderella, so you would think Cinderella should be good and interesting. But it's kind of hard seeing how they update all these other elements. The prince is more interesting, the king is more interesting, the stepmother is interesting. There's less of cute little mice and more chemistry between the romantic leads. Somewhere between this live action version and the anime version, there's a really good rendition of Cinderella that's waiting to get out. Honestly, if you want a good one that actually has an interesting character and tells the story in a unique, awesome way, go see Ever After. In my opinion, it's the most fun and interesting rendition of the Cinderella story with a smart, interesting, complex lead. With this one, it is difficult to like if you don't make your main character relatable. Where the original did have problems that were just kind of problems of Disney fairy tales in the day, this one updates some, but then makes others a little worse. I guess I'm glad I saw it. I mean, it did look interesting, and it was very elegant and pretty. It obviously tried really hard. It just tried so hard in some areas that it got lost and confused about what it actually was getting across. It's hard to say. If you're looking for just a nice little fairy tale where women wear pretty dresses and dance with princes and such, you'll like it fine. If you want to feel more emotion than you did in the original Cinderella, I don't know if you're gonna get much of that. Because like I said, it's just hard to relate with this character. I guess it's just kind of a pick your poison. Grab a pumpkin and see for yourself. The plot to Tomorrowland seems eerily similar to what the film actually is. The movie is about a place where every creative dreamer is taken and allowed to explore any creative idea they want with no limitations. Essentially, that's the film in a nutshell. A whole bunch of interesting and imaginative ideas with absolutely no limitations. But the thing is, you kinda need limitations. If not, you get kinda this disorganized, unfocused mess, and yeah, you can start to see where the problem is. The movie opens with a rather awkwardly unfunny introduction by George Clooney, who tells the story about how he used to be a boy genius. He creates a rocket pack, yeah, it's that kind of movie, I guess, and an android that looks like a little girl, takes him to that wonderful place where all creativity is welcome, Tomorrowland. Cut to modern day, where another little genius named Casey is given a pin that allows her to see Tomorrowland, but not quite get there. When she tries to look for more information about it, suddenly robots and all sorts of villains are chasing her down. The little android from before named Athena comes back into play, and she leads her to George Clooney who in turn takes her to Tomorrowland. Why? Because he apparently created a device that could depict the end of the world. And guess what? It's coming up. But his calculations show that Casey might be the key in order to fix everything. Will they make it in time and stop an evil genius, played by Hugh Laurie, from making this self-fulfilling prophecy come true? Does Disney like really obvious tie-ins to its theme parks? Literally having the opening take place at one of their theme parks? I think you know the answer to this. Okay, so I'll start off with the worst part. The opening is awful. The writing, it's horrendously bad. This is so weird because this is a Brad Bird film and he's usually very good at directing this kind of stuff, but man. Every line is about dreaming and wishing and whimsicalness and following your heart and all that stupid stuff you hear on Disney Channel movies just repeated over and over and over. Everything they say is like a mini speech, just nobody talks normal. When I first started watching it, I was thinking to myself, oh man, am I in for a bad ride. But luckily, it does get a lot better. 
Like when you do finally see Tomorrowland, it's very impressively done, and most of it just done in one shot. The action and comedy get a lot better too, with a lot of creative inventions and fight scenes. And on top of that, they start throwing in some really interesting ideas. For example, Clooney when he was a little boy falls in love with the android. Naturally, he's gonna get older and she's not. Also on top of the fact that she's an android and quote unquote can't feel love. This could so easily be uncomfortable seeing a grown man like George Clooney kind of talking to this little girl that he used to be attracted to. But it's played just right so you feel more the tragedy of it rather than the creepiness of it. I know, it sounds weird, downright disturbing, but it's actually kind of handled pretty well. And as you guess, a lot of the ideas behind the technology is very inventive. The device that lets you see into the future and the way it operates is very cleverly done. Just watching it, you get a feeling like you could handle it. I love movies that work that way, like you feel like you could actually kind of operate these things. In the trailers, they show Tomorrowland. It looks grand and phenomenal, but in the movie, that's all you see. In fact, it's not even the real thing, without giving away too much, because actually it's kind of a clever twist. But when you do actually get there, it's very empty and lifeless. I know that's the point, but wasn't the whole focus of this movie to see Tomorrowland? We get one incredible long tracking shot, and that's it. It's cool, but that's the name of the movie, Tomorrowland! It should look awesome! On top of that, because there's so much going on and so much information thrown at you so quickly, it's kinda hard to understand at times. For example, Hugh Laurie says that the world is doomed, but Tomorrowland is gonna be fine. Well, if that's the case, how come nobody's in Tomorrowland anymore, and how come it almost looks destroyed? There's also this great big long speech that's kind of explaining why Hugh Laurie thinks the world kinda should blow up, and I don't know, I can't tell if it's actually really profound or super preachy. Bottom line, it's so complicated, you're still not quite sure what the motivation is. Now don't get me wrong, a movie that really wants to challenge you with some different philosophies and such, that's welcomed. But the movie literally opened up with a little boy creating a rocket pack and flying it around Tomorrowland. How are we supposed to follow this incredibly complicated, philosophical technobabble? Is this a fun little fantasy or a super liberal that's trying to write out all his aggressions? Even the acting seems on and off. George Clooney sometimes can be very charming, but then other times his comedic timing is really off. Same thing with Casey. Sometimes she talks like someone her age, and then other times she just sounds so over-the-top whimsical and shoving the message in your face that's just irritating. The only thing that's constantly good through it is the android. They pick a really good actress to play her, and yeah, she has to do some very complicated, unique scenes with George Clooney and this kinda, not really, sorta romance that was going on. But she completely pulls it off, and she's totally convincing. She's easily the best part of the movie. As for the rest, I don't know, it kinda feels like it's trying to be a dark and gritty Meet the Robinsons. Except where the message in that one, while also hammered in, was kept very simple. This one, the entire world depends on it. If everybody doesn't follow their dreams, we're all gonna be destroyed! It just seems a little too extreme for me. And much like the idea behind the world itself, I feel it does need limitations. It does need people to say, maybe not this, maybe we should try something else. It's a cool thought to see creativity just bloom and never be filtered, but I think the moral of the story would have been more interesting if it was showing that limitations are needed. Compromises are gonna have to be made. I'm still happy I saw it, if for anything else, just for a lot of these creative and unique ideas. But tone-wise, it's all over the place. Sometimes it feels very adult, sometimes it feels unbelievably childish. Sometimes the effects are amazing, sometimes they're ridiculous. Sometimes it's whimsical, sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's too fast. It's about as uneven a film as you can get. Me personally, I like it when ideas are sort of dropped in my brain and can sort of fiddle around in there, so I can definitely take that from it. But if you're looking for a movie that's much more put together and easy to follow, Sadly, it seems like it's another dream away. Well, here's a first. I'm actually doing a re-review of a Disney December I did, Hocus Pocus. As a lot of you know, when I saw this film, I really didn't like it. In fact, I downright hated it. To a point where people were asking for years for me to do a nostalgia critic of it. I finally did, I sat down, watched it again, and... Yeah, I still didn't like it, but I will admit it wasn't quite as bad as I remembered. The review is pretty obvious in what I'm trying to say, but if you wanted a more down-to-earth talk about it, I guess that's what this video is for. So let's address the things I didn't like about it originally. 
The big focus was the virgin talk. Everybody gave this kid such a hard time for him being a virgin. Hell, it's even the final line. I always remember that being a problem, and while it still is, I'll admit it's not as bad as I remember. Even when I did the movie review, I made a conscious effort not to mention it as many times as the movie does. Which I think is something like four or five times. That's still weird, but yeah, it's wrong to say it's the focus of the entire film. I brought up how the witches don't have anything funny to say, and that's still true. But watching it again, I realize even though they really don't have anything funny to say, they still kind of say it in a funny way. These three actresses are actually really enjoyable. You kind of get the feeling they weren't given anything to work with, but they just said, screw it, we're gonna throw our all into every single moment we're on screen, and it shows. I get the feeling they sort of huddled together and talked about how they're gonna move and what each one is gonna do when the camera starts rolling. Does that excuse the bad writing? No, but it does kind of make it a little entertaining. These three are a lot of fun to watch. Now, does that excuse how incredibly bland the main characters are? No. Does that excuse how this story makes absolutely no sense whatsoever? No. Does that excuse a lot of really awkward, just downright stupid moments? Absolutely not. But over time, I am realizing more and more why this is getting a following, and that the correct terminology for it really is guilty pleasure. It's like my love for Ernest Saves Christmas. It is a stupid movie and nothing makes sense about it, but some things are just so good I can't help but watch it every year. Hocus Pocus, I can now see, is kind of the same way. There is a lot of Halloween in it, there are a lot of nice visuals. It's over the top and cartoony, but that just kind of makes it stand out even more. The song sequence with her singing is a lot of fun. A lot of the effects actually still kind of hold up. And even all those cliched 90s tropes, I think people are kind of laughing at how cliched they are now, and how you did see them just in every kid's movie at the time. It doesn't mean it's by any means smart, but I can see how people can be really entertained by it. It's hard for me to say I actually enjoy it, but I do enjoy parts. Enough to at least finally see why other people enjoy it, and I think that's an important thing to understand. So I guess the conclusion of this re-review is, if you're really forgiving and just want to see some Halloween visuals, you'll probably be satisfied here. Or if you really like those classic 90s tropes and you just kind of want to have a laugh at them, you'll probably really like this too. I still really don't like those scenes where they address the whole weird virgin shaming, but like I said, it's not as focused on as I remember it. So maybe the majority of kids watch it will probably overlook that too and just be distracted by how entertaining the three witches are. I just felt like this movie deserved a second chance. Do I still like it? No, but I can understand why others like it. If this is something you watch every Halloween, I finally get it. I probably won't be joining the group, but I can at least say there are some really fun and weird things about it that you can get a few laughs at. I'll enjoy my incredibly silly, stupid guilty pleasures, and you can enjoy yours. For years, I said my favorite Pixar movie is Up, but now that has finally changed to Inside Out. Not only the best Pixar film ever written, but one of the best Disney films I've ever seen. This is a movie that takes an idea and does everything great that you can do with it. The setup is that everybody's mind is fueled by emotions, and here the emotions are personalized. They're basically what you would think, joy is very happy, sadness is very depressed, fear is very paranoid, you get the idea. We focus on the emotions of a girl named Riley, who's moving from one new location to another. Such a large change is throwing her emotions out of whack, and we find that Joy and Sadness are accidentally separated from headquarters and dropped off somewhere else. Thus, the movie is just them trying to get back in order to bring balance back to Riley's emotional state. In doing so, Joy and Sadness, two polar opposites, have to find a way to get along in order to work together. Now the idea of emotions having personalities in your head is nothing new. This has been done in Warner Brothers cartoons, Disney cartoons, hell there's even a sitcom about it called Herman's Head. But this is the first one that said maybe we can not only do something funny with this, but also really dramatic, something that anybody of any age can understand. The story is actually a coming of age story, talking about change. Talking about adapting, talking about sacrifices, talking about how some things have to be pushed out of your mind and replaced with others and all the hardships of growing up are shown through these characters. 
who are developing Riley as she goes through these tough moments. Whether you're a kid going through these moments or an adult who used to go through these moments, everybody can sympathize. You get these problems, you get these frustrations, you understand how hard it is to adapt. But at the same time, it balances out with a lot of bright colors and funny moments and goofy moments, which is really what the film is about, balance. Joy and Sadness don't get along, but like a lot of buddy movies, they realize that they have to get along. Well here, it actually serves a purpose. Joy's the one who's usually in charge and tries to keep Sadness off to the sidelines. But the movie so brilliantly shows how much Joy and Sadness are actually tied together. I won't give away, but let's just say, it's brilliant. It's summed up through visuals that everybody can understand and everybody can relate to. So many of us try to run away from sadness, we think it's not healthy, but this movie shows it's unbelievably healthy. All your emotions are healthy, you just have to know how to keep them in check. The movie shows it's okay to feel however you feel. There's no shame in feeling sad, there's no shame in feeling angry. If anything, by confronting them, you create new emotions and new moments. And the best thing is, it sticks to the choices they make. When they move, they stay moved. When a character has to disappear, he stays disappeared. They don't pull any happily ever after retconning stuff. No, they mean this stuff for serious. Because it's all part of growing up and you're gonna have to go through hardships and you're just gonna have to accept it. It's so great that a movie about emotions talks about all this. In fact, it's the perfect movie to talk about all this. With all the unnecessary Pixar sequels coming out, this is one of the few that I would love to see a sequel to. I would love to see movies that follows Riley into adulthood. The same way the toys in Toy Story grow up with Andy, I would love to see the emotions grow up with Riley. What new developments could we relate to and in what creative way would they show it? There's so many opportunities with this idea. In fact, if you watch the Blu-ray, you can see all the other ideas they were gonna do but couldn't because there wasn't enough time. They're all great and I love to see more of these come about. This is a movie that not only leaves me wanting more, it leaves me wanting a lot more. Why can't this get a spin-off universe? Why can't this have other stories and other characters that can lead to other movies? To me, that's the sign of a really, really good flick. I guess if I really have to nitpick, the only problem I have is that it could have been a little funnier. Like there's a scene where they had to wake up this scary clown in order to give her a nightmare. That thing could have been a lot scarier and led to a lot more comedy. There's a few lines and a few scenes I thought could have used just a little bit more of a punch to it. While I definitely laughed at a lot of scenes, I wasn't laughing super hard. At least not as much as some of the other Pixar films. But like I said, it's a nitpick. Really, everything for the most part balances out incredibly well. I still laughed at the right moments, I still cried at the right moments. Quite fittingly, every emotion that's supposed to play out, plays out. Every time I see it, it gets better and better. The stories, the characters, the layout, it's just phenomenal. In my opinion, it's as perfect a Pixar movie as you can get. And definitely a good one to end this Disney Simber on. Thank you all once again for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and yeah, maybe in January I'll do a few by popular demands again. But for this year, it's great to see that Disney is still dishing out the creativity and new ideas, and continuing to inspire. Thank you all so much for joining me, and I'll see you next year. Popular demand, it's Mars Needs Moms. Yeah, sorry it took so long to get to these. We've kind of been busy with a few other things, but here I am and I finally saw one of Disney's biggest disappointments. The critical and box office flop that actually destroyed Robert Zemeckis' motion capture company. Yep, remember Polar Express, Beowulf, Christmas Carol? You're gonna see nothing like that anymore because this is the film that killed it. Some would say that's a shame, others would say thank God because if they kept turning out films like this, yeah, it's not a big loss. The film is about a little boy who's having trouble getting along with his mother, only to discover she's being kidnapped by aliens and he follows along. They're taken to a planet that's ruled by females who have absolutely no idea how to take care of children. Huh, then how did they survive all these years? Okay, we'll get to all that. 
The boy comes across another guy who was taken hostage long ago, and while he doesn't like what they do, he just sort of learns to accept it because he has no other choice. But the boy says he does have a choice, and thus the two of them, as well as an alien graffiti artist, decide to change how Mars works, fight the evil repressive system, and stop all the mothers from being destroyed. Oh yeah, when the mothers outuse their usefulness, they just blow them up. And that gets to kind of the major problem of this movie. Okay, I know they always say don't judge a movie by its title, but the title of this movie is Mars Needs Moms. Okay, it's stupid. It's one of the worst titles for a movie ever. But at least when you hear it, you get an idea of what you're going to get. Something playful, something goofy and colorful, kind of lighthearted. But no, this is a really dark, miserable looking, even intense film. There's a scene where one of the characters talks about seeing his mother actually get destroyed right in front of his eyes. And it's told really slowly and really dramatically. And all I can think to myself is, Mars needs moms. But that wouldn't really matter if the film was, say, creative or charming or imaginative. And it's surprisingly not. I know the idea of this world is that it's supposed to be repressive and there isn't any color, but come on. Even for a repressive world, we've seen this a million times. It looks like Tron. It looks like 1984. It looks like The Matrix. It looks like all these movies we've seen with miserable worlds a bajillion times, and it's just not interesting anymore. I guess the idea of a race run by females and all the males are just kind of left in the garbage is kind of interesting, but even then, I'm not really sure what kind of commentary they're trying to get across, if any. Is this like a Wicker Man remake? Is women taking over a good thing or a bad thing? Or is it supposed to show, ironically, how like how men treat women or women treat men? Or, I, I don't know. Maybe there is no commentary. Maybe it's just the way this planet does things and they just need an enemy to go after. And that's exactly what this film feels like. It feels like everything is there just so it can kind of be there. A kid travels to Mars because kids want to travel to Mars. They fight oppressive systems because kids like fighting oppressive systems. Hey, look how much they argue with their parents. We're going to motion capture Seth Green as the little kid, even though he doesn't do any of the voice because we just kind of motion capture celebrities for some reason. At least with Tom Hanks and Jim Carrey, they were in the movie. They got to use their voices, but... Seth Green? I mean, he's a fine actor, but did you absolutely need this guy in this role? I can tell you that his addition doesn't add anything, nor any of the characters. Joan Cusack, she's one of my favorite actresses. She is so funny and so entertaining, yet she's just there to kind of be there. For a film about kid who wants to go save his mother, they don't make this mother interesting at all. And it's such a shame to hear someone I know is so uniquely fun like Joan Cusack just given nothing to work with. So, I guess if you're just in a mood to say, fight the power and the repressive whatevers as, hey, those films do well sometimes, this one definitely doesn't make any sense, but I guess if you just want to get that rebellious emotion out of your system? But aside from that, I have no idea who would enjoy this film. It's not the worst, it's just dull, and when it's not dull, it's kind of unpleasant. And for a movie called Mars Needs Moms, you wouldn't expect something so grim and depressing. In terms of at least seeing a yearly film with motion capture that's going to look like a really high-budget production, they're pretty much extinct now. Again, it's hard to say this is a good thing or a bad thing, but if they're anything like this film, I can say we definitely trade it up. By popular demand, it's Muppet Treasure Island. Why are all the popular demands this year films that didn't do financially well? I don't know, whatever. This is the second Muppet film to be an actual adaptation of a literary classic. The first one being the previous film, Christmas Carol. And with Christmas Carol being such a big hit, you would think audiences would go and see this one as well. But from what I hear, it didn't do so hot. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't see why, but at the same time... Look! It's Tim Curry! Tim Curry with the Muppets! He practically is a Muppet! This is a match made in heaven! Okay, well, let's look at the story, as if you don't know. It's pretty much the story of Treasure Island. A young boy named Jim Hawkins comes across a treasure map. This leads to a giant expedition, only this time the captain is played by Kermit the Frog. And the majority of the cast seem to be Muppets as well. That is, of course, for the cook. 
Long John Silver played by Tim Curry. By God, is this a match made in heaven. And yes, it's just as entertaining as you think it would be. I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying this, but Long John Silver has an evil plan and he's gonna mutiny the ship to find the treasure and yeah, come on, you've all read the book, you know what happens, and it sticks pretty close to it. Eh, for the most part, it still has a lot of Muppetisms that most of the time are welcomed. The only strange thing is that one of the most popular Muppet characters, Miss Piggy, doesn't come in until the last third. In fact, the more I think about it, she didn't even get much of a role in Christmas Carol either, did she? I guess neither of these stories had that big a focus on women, so you can kind of understand why, but come on, you're already taking so many liberties in other areas, why couldn't you get Miss Piggy in there? At least a lot earlier. But much like Christmas Carol, it does try to really stick to the source material and kind of the feel, just like I said, this time with Muppets in the part. They'll have little fourth wall jokes, they'll have songs that suddenly come out of nowhere, and kind of like Muppet Christmas Carol, it's fine. I guess people had a little bit more of a connection with Christmas Carol because A, it's Christmas and it's already going to be a sentimental connection, and B, there did seem to be a little bit more heart to it, maybe just because of the story it is. With this one, it just kind of feels like a longer Muppet Show sketch. At least, with the Muppets, when it needs to be serious with Jim Hawkins and stuff, it does it fine. I mean, it's not the best telling or anything, but it's totally passable. The songs are just as good as Christmas Carol 2. I actually love the intro song so much, I put it on my top 11 favorite villain songs list. And Hans Zimmer, who I swear can do no wrong, does the orchestrations for these songs, and they sound pretty badass. Except, when well, they're not supposed to sound badass. I mean, you know how it works. And speaking of singing silliness, let's talk about Tim Curry. This is a guy who, even if he does a bad performance, it'll still be a good performance. There's just some kind of magic to him that makes it so much fun to watch. I can't even really decide if this is a good performance or not. It's just insanely entertaining. Just seeing him look down to Kermit the Frog, give a salute, and go, Aye, aye, Captain! I mean, how can you not fall in love with this guy? Though, to his credit, he does manage to get a nice connection with Jim Hawkins as well, as he's supposed to in the story. And, yeah, whether you want to see it as it's so awkward it's charming, or it's so charming it's awkward, he does really work in the role. I almost wouldn't mind seeing him in another rendition of Treasure Island where he is Long John Silver. Like, a serious one. But that's not what this is. This is a bunch of hand puppets trying to retell this story in a goofy way with some serious moments, and I think it just kind of depends on what mood you're in. There's nothing really spectacular about it. I mean, even Muppet Christmas had more of a visual sense than this one did. But if you say the title out loud, Muppet Treasure Island with Tim Curry, and you say to yourself, yeah, that might be a little fun, that's exactly what you'll get. I get the feeling there's better renditions of this tale, but as one that has little Muppets going around singing songs and such, it's totally fine. Shiver your timbers and find out for yourself. <laughs>